Alrighty, here I am. Give me a second to get slightly organized. But I think I've got this right. Let's see, how do I turn on that picture yet? Well, you know, how did I do this, people? How about this? Hey, there we go. So uh, please let me know if I sound okay, because uh, I'm using a different microphone and I want to make sure the volume's are uh, the right amount, not too loud, not too soft. So I'd love some input on that. And uh, hi guys, so let me just kind of go through the list. So Tammy, your skimmer stand went out yesterday, so it's on the way. And uh, hi Andrea. Let's see, there's Eric. Your order went out yesterday too. I uh, shipped out about 20 orders yesterday. And last night I took the time to figure out all the orders I'm, uh, you know, that are pending. So I've got quite the list. All right, good. So volume is good. Uh, today's topic, I had kind of something else in mind at first, but uh, it ended up uh, that we're going to go with, I mean, this was kind of my backup plan, <laughs> but I was hoping to talk with Bobby, my tank sitter, and do an interview with him, but he wasn't available after all. So we're, uh, which is totally fine because I wasn't really set up for two microphones. I'm so used to doing a solo show that incorporating something extra is just leaving room for me to mess it up. So I wanted to uh, talk about waste collectors and why they're so important, why you need one. And I've had one for years. And I just feel like if you are running a protein skimmer without one of these, you're actually making your life so much more difficult. Because when a protein skimmer messes up and when the, uh, the skimmer overflows, it makes a big mess. And that can be very uh, frustrating because you're having to wipe everything down. You've got to clean your cabinet. You know, you... Plus, you know, the skimmer is still doing whatever it's doing. So I really like a waste collector to catch all the skim aid that comes out. So uh, I, what I did was I borrowed this one off my reef today. Uh, this one here was made by Bash C. And uh, I actually got it at a frag swap for $25 for the container. And I knew there's more than $25 in this acrylic alone. And I was like, I'd much rather just use this and have to build my own. But technically, yes, you could make your own. You can use any kind of container you want. What you need is this float switch. That switch is so important, and if you don't have it, um, you need to buy one. Now, I sell them in the shop, and I uh, think these are like 10 or 12 bucks, maybe less. I can't remember exactly. And I have quite a few, because uh, I bought a whole bunch a long time ago, and then I never told anybody I had them. <laughs> they, they are on the website. They are electronic. Uh, so in other words, they have to be connected to something. And in the case, what I do, because I own an Apex, I have something called a breakout box, which is this device right here, that on the bottom of it has a bunch of screw holes that you would then connect wires to it, and you can connect up to, um, I want to say eight devices. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe seven devices, maybe even six. But I only needed two wires to connect to this, and that was the first thing I hooked up to my breakout box, or what everyone calls the bob. So you hook up the bob, the bob plugs right into the apex, super easy, and then you hook up the float switch where you need it. Uh, so there's a lot of uses for float switches. They can be used in your sump, they can be used in a top-off container, they can be used in a, uh, in a waste collector, I said top-off container, waste collector, and the premise is, is that when the water rises, it lifts the float, so this goes up, and it closes the circuit, and that would then allow your controller to turn that item on or off based on the conditions of the float. So if the float is down, allow the pump to run. When the float is up, stop the pump. So what pump am I stopping? My protein skimmer is an IOS 300. I've been using that skimmer for about three, four years. And inside the body of that skimmer are two pumps. So what I've got set up on my particular setup is that when this uh, pump fails, you know, I mean, when the uh, container is full, I gotta get my brain straight. When the container is totally full, and the switch goes up, it turns off one of the two pumps. So the other pump is still going inside the skimmer, but there's not two pumps worth, and so the skimmer can't overflow anymore. It literally stops any more liquid from draining in out of the collection cup and into the waste collector. Now, I'm gonna jump ahead here for a second. Put this a little bit lower. Um, because sometimes you'll notice your protein skimmer comes with a tube that goes under the collection cup, but it may not be long enough for what you need. And someone just asked me this this week on the on the Club Miller's Reef. So I said, all you have to do is insert another piece of tubing that's a little bit smaller inside the larger tubing. And that way, you know, you can get the additional length necessary to reach your waste collector. Now, if your protein skimmer is down in the sump, 
and your sump is right here, you know, the edge of it, the tubing can drain properly. But if your sump is tall and you're doing this number, that's not going to work out very well because it's going to kind of trap liquid here. It's not going to drain properly. You really do want the water to come out of the collection cup and go into the waste collector in a smooth downhill, just like any kind of sewage drain. Drain always go downhill. You never go up and back down. There's no hooks because we're not pumping it out. It's draining out through gravity. I have run it in the past where it was just slightly down and it basically kept up because as the cup got really full, it would force it down but it wasn't a great situation. And so when I replaced my sump last year, I intentionally made sure to make sure I wasn't gonna have any surprises, that I would have the waste collector at the right height, I'd have the protein skimmer at the right height, I had a little stand under the skimmer to lift it up a little bit. And that worked out perfectly fine for my scenario. Now, normally this tube would be connected to my collection cup. I borrowed it for this video. And then when I take my collection cup off of the protein skimmer, this is on there, I usually have my hand and I'm holding the cup, it's sort of like I'm holding the cup and the hose like this as I go to the kitchen to clean it up because if you were to just let it dangle, it'll just dribble all over the floor and make a big mess and we don't want a mess in our house, of course. And it doesn't really matter how deeply your tubing goes into here. This one's actually, uh, this could be trimmed off. You know, it doesn't need to be that far inside. It just needs to stay in there and not flop out accidentally. But any kind of container that you can use would suffice. If you have a bucket, you could use a bucket. Uh, if you wanted to use a milk jug, you could use a milk jug. If you had some kind of a one gallon pitcher or maybe one of those Rubbermaid containers like you put spaghetti in, uh, people have used two liter bottles, just anything that you can get the float switch into, that's the most important part because the switch has to be in there and it needs to be secured in the unit. So what I did with this one, this uh, system comes with, it was designed differently than what I did. So I believe inside here was a ping pong ball initially. And I didn't want a ping, pong, ping pong ball to stop the protein skimmer. I wanted power to stop the skimmer. So instead, I just drilled a small hole in the bottom, and I installed the float switch in there. The switch itself has a, a little nut on here that you can just twist to tighten, and it fits on up to quarter inch thick. Eighth inch would be better, but quarter inch acrylic works just fine with this. And I believe the gap you need is about quarter inch, maybe uh, five sixteenths for the threaded section to slide in between your plastic bracket. You could potentially make a bracket and just drill a hole and then thread the wire through and then thread the nut back down and tighten it down on top of the little bracket you made. But I always like the option to remove something through a slot. So if you can make a tab that has a notch in it, you could put this in there and tighten the nut to keep it in place, now it's set. Uh, there's no benefit to running the switch upside down in this scenario, so I wouldn't recommend that. And if for any reason it's not working as planned, there's a chance that this piece right here is on upside down. And all you have to do is remove this retaining clip off the bottom, take this off, turn it over, put it back on, put the clip back on, and try again. And that's how you can check to make sure that the switch is working. Now, if you don't have an apex and you're trying to do something else, there is a way of doing it. I don't, I'm not prepared to explain all that on this stream other than to tell you you're going to be using a solenoid and you'll be using, because this is a low voltage. You know, we're not going to run 110 volts to this. We're going to run like 12 volt or 9 volt. And so you want some kind of a solenoid and some kind of a small power supply. And you're going to cobble that together. And then this thing will actually turn on and off. And then based on that solenoid being open or closed, it will control the pump on your protein skimmer. So how does it do that? Well, just like the Apex has all these outlets connected to a brain, when this rises and the liquid is full and it's wants to shut off because it's too full. It tells the apex float switches up. The apex says, oh, the float switch is up. That means I need to turn off outlet C3, for example, and C3 is shut off until this switch drops again. And that's how I pretty much had mine programmed forever. But before I had this, I did something differently. And like I was saying, I used a solenoid. I had an outlet box, like a gang box with an outlet on it, and I plugged my skimmer into it. And when the float switch rose, it closed the solenoid, which stopped the power to the outlet, which that outlet being dead, the protein skimmer's pump turned off. So it's, there's more DIY involved in that one than this. And so I wanted to uh, uh, explain this to you for a second. Now there's one more thing that I want to show you and I forgot to bring it over here. I'm going to go get it. But my microphone apparently works when I walk away, I've been told. So I can still chat with you. Okay, I'm coming back. 
Now, I bought this, uh, I don't know, six, eight months ago, and I still haven't even opened the box. But this is a device where it puts a sensor, an optical sensor, inside the collection cup of your protein skimmer. But technically, it could be in the side of your waste collector. And then it will kill the power to the outlet that the protein skimmer is plugged into. So the idea is if the cup is full, or the waste collector is full, then your power shuts off, protein skimmer stops doing anything. Um, if for some reason, I'll put this up here where you can see it, it's from Auto Aqua, and uh, Coralview sells it, and I think they're about 60 bucks for this little gizmo. And I have been planning, <laughs> just haven't gotten around to it, installing it on the Frag Systems Collection Cup, because that protein skimmer does not have a waste collector, and so it's kind of messy. But uh, I think that this could be used on a waste collector as well. So why the waste collector? Why does that matter? Who cares? Why can't you just take off the cup and clean it out like a normal person, like everyone else does? Well, for one, the waste collector can hold more solution over time. Uh, this one here probably holds about a gallon and a quarter, gallon and a half. And there have been times where it's filled to the top. There's been times where it just overflowed. I mean, it filled so fast that the switch came up, but it still was not fast enough to stop the pump on the skimmer before the... The, col the, the collection cup was so full, it just kept going, and it flooded into my fish room and went down the, the French drain. But for the most part, I don't have that problem. That's really rare when, situ when a circumstance is like that. But the reason I like the waste collector connected to a protein skimmer is because it will shut off that skimmer before you get the big mess in the sump. You're not having to clean off the top rim of the sump. You're not having to clean off the inside of your stand. You're not having to wipe down any nearby equipment that got spattered because the cup is always empty. The cup never fills up with a lot of liquid because there's a drain at the bottom. And if your skimmer doesn't have a drain on the collection cup right now, you can install an elbow in there and then run tubing, like a John Guest fitting. You can thread it yourself, screw that elbow in, put some uh, quarter inch uh, RO tubing or ice maker tubing straight into a waste collector and let it uh, drain the liquid as quickly as it gets in the cup. So for example, um, I just washed this, hmm, five, six days ago, and there was about this much skin made in it. It was barely any, but I didn't want to smell it while I was standing here talking to you on camera, so I washed it really quick before the live stream. The, there are usually times where my waste collector is full about halfway, and I will drain it, I'll wash it out, and then I'll take the collection cup off my protein skimmer and I'll clean it and reinstall it. And the uh, waste collector itself, and there's something else I have to tell you here, but the waste collector itself has a quick disconnect that I chose to go with where I just used two RCA jacks, male and female, so I could bring the entire unit to the sink. But most of the time, what I do is I just take the lid off, it's still connected to the other part and straight to the apex, and I just set it on the floor of the fish room, and I will take this to the sink to get it washed and uh, bring it back. But I did like the idea of not being hardwired to the breakout box because the one thing you don't do with a breakout box is loosen and tighten those screws every single time you want to clean something. That would be a nightmare. So you do want some kind of ability, some kind of awesome little plug system where you can take them apart. Now, as I said, I modified this slightly because like there was a ping pong ball in there. The top area here is actually way larger than I need. I don't need any of this on top. But what it was for... It has a little screen in there. You could actually put carbon in here and then set this on top and it would, as the liquid is pouring in, air is coming out, it would kind of kill some of the odor. So it's an odor eater, so to speak, on the top here, but I've never, I tried carbon once and I was like, this is way too much hassle. I don't like it. <laughs> never did it again. So technically, I don't even need any part of this other than maybe a solid cap with no hole at all. And you do want to make sure that the tubing going into whatever container you're going to use has a little bit of room for the container to breathe, obviously, so lick can go in and air can get out. So maybe it's fine just leaving it the way it is. Now, if you are using the Apex and you don't want to use a float switch, you could use an optical sensor. So this right here is an optical sensor, and this is the actual sensor itself. This is a clip, and this is magnetic, so it would actually hold on to the container and it could be inside and you'd run, but you'd have to run the wire up and out of the container. You need some kind of a notch in your lid or a hole up high or something to run, run this through because you've got this size jack. And this plugs into the FMM, which is the fluid monitoring module, the same module that um, we use for the ATK, which is the top-off system. 
But this is another way of doing it where you could put something inside and magnetically do it. But I kind of, you know, like I said, if you don't have an apex, I feel like this little guy would probably do the job really, really nicely. So that's something you might want to consider. Trying to think what else I want to tell you about this. Oh, um, okay, here's an important one. So let's say you are an Apex owner and you're copying me and you're like, I'm gonna do this waste collector because Mark talked me into it. Then one thing that can happen that can be problematic, you'll, you'll be kind of annoying. And so what I did was I programmed some extra code into my uh, Apex Fusion, which is the, the, the control panel to talk to it. Um, when that float switch rises, like I said, it stops the skimmer. The second you let go of it, you know, when you lift out of the container, it's no longer in liquid, it drops, right? And when that happens, the apex senses, hey, it's not sitting in water anymore, turn the skimmer back on. And so literally, as I lift it out of the lid, the skimmer turns right back on and starts producing skimmate and could potentially even overflow because it was already in overflow mode before. So it might want to continue initially. So what I did to avoid that problem is I inserted a line of code that tells the unit to wait seven minutes from the point that I uh, lift the lid off. So I lift off the lid and then there's a defer command that says wait seven minutes and then turn on the protein skimmer. And the reason I did that is it gave me plenty of time to actually take this unit, go wash it at the sink, take the collection cup off, wash it in the sink, put both pieces back on. And usually by the time I put everything back in place within about, I don't know, 15 to 30 seconds, you could just, you heard the pump come on and it starts to skim again and everything's in place. So that, that gave me a window to walk away, clean something up and bring it back. And I, that's not a default in, in any scenario, you have to put that in. And that is something that, uh, you know, you definitely want to code. So I would, I, I'm glad I did it and it worked out really well. It's worked out perfectly. And I've probably been running this same one for, Oh, I don't know, five or six years. And I remember when I installed it, I thought I should have done this five years before because I cannot tell you how many times I had to clean off the top of the protein skimmer and on top of my, my sump, it was always a spatter and the spatter went everywhere. It would hit the back of my electrical. It would hit you know, the top of the reactors. It got on the refugium light. Uh, I got on the rim of the sump. I mean, it really spatters everywhere. It's amazing how far a droplet of water can travel. And so this uh, made my life so much easier. Oh, I gotta walk away one more time. I hear my RO system trying to turn off. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'd meant to shut that off before I started the stream. All right. So now what I'd like to do is see if you have any questions about what I've discussed so far, and then we'll continue. So let me scroll up really quick. Have a sip of coffee. <laughs> One person says, now I can test my water. Yes, it's water test Saturday. Let's see. Um, Carl, I'll just answer your question now. He says, how, how long should I wait to do a water change after dosing for Debio? It has nothing to do with dosing. You just dose for Debio every 15 days. You do your water changes whenever you want to do them. And we are jumping into questions. GF says, I have a peppermint hogfish for many months. Today I started eating my Duncan. Is there any suggestions to keep both of them at the same time? They're both my favorites. Uh, I don't have a great suggestion other than get that coral away from the fish for now. Uh, maybe move it to a new area, put some kind of protection around it for the time being but you may end up sacrificing that one coral to that fish. Maybe you could plant a piece of it somewhere else and it doesn't go for it in that spot. Don't know. Uh, Reefkeeper, okay, so now we're talking about waste collectors. He says, I'm too OCD to need a waste collector. I clean my skimmer cup often. You know, I used to clean my protein skimmers collection cup every single day. Every day or every night, I would take the cup off the skimmer, I would drain it out, clean it, and I clean the neck and then I put it back on, and I never had to worry about a protein skimmer overflowing and putting old skimmate back into my sump. And that worked you know, perfectly well, but it was very manual. <laughs> and then later when I added the, uh, the skimmer swabby, which is the squeegee that cleans the neck of the protein skimmer, I 
wasn't taking the cup off nearly as much, and it would fill up with solution, and because there was a hassle factor. Now you've got to take the entire apparatus with the, the motor that has the squeegee and the power cord and carry all that to the sink. And when I was able to get a drain going to the waste collector, I could kind of ignore the collection cup for a long time. I'd probably take it off once every two weeks or even once a month. It would get really gunked up on the squeegee itself, but the neck was clean. The lid of the collection cup was disgusting, and you know the squeegee apparatus was, you know, the the arm and the bracket, all that was just coated with this green goo, which would take you know a little more time to clean off. But it just that squabby made my life suddenly easier. I didn't have to clean my collection cup so much. And when I had a little protein skimmer that hung on the back of my 29 gallon aquarium, I had the Aqua Sea Remora protein skimmer. I had a little square collection cup on the top. I took that off every single day and dumped it out because that was hanging on the back of my tank behind the tank. And if that collection cup were to overflow, it would overflow behind the tank and all over my furniture and onto the carpet. So I made it a, you know, it was a very normal practice for me to remove that cup, rinse it out, clean it, put it back on, put the lid back on top. So I would definitely recommend if you're not going to automate things and do this kind of scenario, then be sure you're staying on top of cleaning those out. And especially this time of year, as we're getting a lot of weather, a lot of weather changes. Uh, last night, you know, I didn't even know there was rain coming, and then there was thunder, and there was lightning, and it rained all night. And I was glad my protein skimmers had just been cleaned, because a protein skimmer can suddenly overflow um, when the barometric pressure in your area changes. It has nothing to do with the temperature of your room. It, it has to do with barometric pressure, humidity levels. These are things within the house as well as externally outside of your home that can affect and make a protein skimmer just turn into a volcano for no apparent reason. And if you have seven days worth of skimmate in the collection cup, it's going to add more liquid and it's just going to blow over and make a big mess. At least if you have the waste collector, the waste is here. And if the protein skimmer goes into volcano mode, it's going to come to here, and then I can take it, the skimmer's already turned itself off, I can go dump this out, reinstall it, adjust the protein skimmer's knob slightly just to kind of dial it in where I need it to be, and everything is good in the world all over again. Oh, yes, thank you, Reef Keeper. He said Reef Octo skimmers, they have a kit uh, by Reef Octopus or Reef Octo that is an exact add-on that you can use for your protein skimmer that has that solenoid outlet thing that you can hook it all up. And then, um, I know a vast marine has some kind of a thing called like the skimmate locker, which I think is a kit that you affix to a bucket. And then you can go ahead and uh, set that all up. The one thing you, like I said, I'm using a mechanical switch, which is really, really important for this to work. There are other types of methods that work out there that deal with when this is full, no more water can go in. It creates like a back pressure on the protein skimmer which then should, in theory, turn off the skimmer. But if the collection cup has holes in the lid, you don't get that back pressure because the air is just pushing out the top of the protein skimmer's collection cup. So there are times, like I had a Life Reef skimmer, and I couldn't do anything with that. I couldn't make one change. Every single idea I came up with when I talked to Jeff, the owner of the company, I said, can I do this? He said, no. Can I do this? He said, no. Would this work? No. Would this work? No. Every, I mean, I had like five or six different things I was trying to do. And... Every single one would not work with his brand of skimmer. I was like, all right. But my Euro Reef had a lot of holes in the lid. And so, like I said, when the cup was really full or when the thing was in volcano mode, it spattered out of like 12 little holes and just went all over the cabinet, and it was very annoying. But if you can find some kind of an add-on kit, like I was saying, this is a cheap one, obviously. The, the one from Reef Octopus probably will cost 100 maybe even 150 But it's, you know, it's, it's rugged, it's durable. Um, when I saw it, I was like, this is awesome. For people that don't have anything, they could get this kit. And they should be able to hook it up in about five minutes flat, and that would be awesome. So thanks, Reefkeeper, for reminding me about that. Uh, Tim says, where did you get the Swabby? I got it from Avast Marine. Avast Marine has all the pirate-based uh, stuff, and the Skimmer Swabby, the minute I saw that, I, I was one of the first people to like jump on board and place an order. And I've been running one ever since. I've probably been running one for 10 or 12 years. I've had to replace the motor two or three times because they eventually burn up. And uh, it's, it just makes my life so much easier. It's... 
Awesome! Battle 611 says, I just ordered the Vast Marine Collector. Perfect. Uh, Gus says, how about a how-to show for the Apex? I kind of did an Apex-based episode, and even a couple people told me in the comments, you know, clearly you work for Neptune Systems now. <laughs> I just happened to wear the Apex shirt because I went to the Apex meetup at Macna. But I had so many Apex products here, it was just like a, sort of like a commercial, but it was really me just explaining each component and what they could do. But I never feel like I'm super qualified to explain how to use the Apex because when you are trying to do exactly what I'm describing, if I don't explain it properly, if I don't get it exactly right, it won't work for you and you'll be upset. I mean, that's why we watch these tutorial videos to know exactly how to do it so we can get the job done. And I just always feel like I'm gonna make a mistake. I'm gonna say it wrong, you know? And so I've talked a couple of times with the guys at Neptune and said, you know, I kind of want to do like a starting from opening the box and just chapter after chapter after chapter doing each part, you know, do it with them so it can't be said wrong. <laughs> Almost like an interview style. And they've said, yeah, but you know, logistically the whole thing of getting them to give me their time to do this is uh, kind of far-fetched. It might be easier for me to make some kind of a series with another uh, Apex uh, guru, you know, somebody you know, like Dwayne or somebody that really knows their stuff and we could just, I would love to do a side-by-side -side with someone. And like I said, just hook up one component after that. Like, all right, you know, we've got the Apex plugged in. Now how do I get on my Wi-Fi? And then we get on that. And like, now I want to hook up my, my protein skimmer. How do I do that? And then now I want to hook up my light. How do I do that? Well, how can I change the color of my light? And I would love to do ser a series, but it's a whole huge undertaking. And odds are there's other guys out there already done it anyway. St. Gingerbread says, it seems like there's a lot of fellow British viewers on this week, fully international audience. Yeah, people listen to this or watch this show from all over the world. It's really cool. Um, Derby City Reef says, my DKH has risen over the last two weeks without a water change or dosing. Any ideas? Not really, unless it's just coming off the rock. Um, but in the meantime, what, what matters is what was the number? What is the number? Is it too high or is it just kind of up, you know? And then... Um, maybe doing a water change to bring it back down to your target level. Um, Afonso says, the last stream at working with acrylic was great for me, one of the best. Would like to know more about the theme. You could build more items, keep up the excellent work and stay safe. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. So I don't know if there's any more questions about the waste collector. Maybe I covered it sufficiently. Oh, someone was saying, could you do something like this for an RODI system? Yeah, I think you could. Um, there's a lot of different methods, but really the simplest method, I mean, the cheapest solution is a float valve, not a float switch. So a float valve is just a float that rises, looks like a big balloon, so to speak, that's on an arm, and your RO tubing feeds water into it, and it trickles into your container, your barrel or your bucket, and when the float comes up, it attempts to turn off your RO system. It may not keep it turned off. Because what happens when the float rises, there's a little thin rubber membrane inside the, the hinged area. And all it's doing is pushing a piece of rubber over the end of the hose. That's all it's doing. And you've got 60 PSI or more coming out of your house water pressure trying to push out this tube with a little thin rubber thing over the tip. So it might bleed a little bit out. And each time it bleeds out a little bit of water, just a few drips, the RO system will turn back on. And it'll shudder to life, and it'll turn off. And it'll shudder to life, and it'll turn off. And it does this over and over until you finally go and turn the system off. So I love to have a float valve in the barrel you're going to collect water in. And then I like an inline ball valve that you can just close the line. So you don't have to actually disconnect tubing or do anything with the RO system itself. You're just at the bucket, at the barrel, and the float has come up, and you just close the line, and now it's sealed, and no more water can come out until you're ready. And then you can you know, easily do a quick disconnect, remove the bucket from the tubing, and you can pour it into something. Um, so I definitely recommend a float valve to keep the floors dry and keep your spouses happy. All right. Well, I don't see any... 
waste collector questions. Uh, so Norb says, have reefers ever plumbed the skimmer drain directly to a house drain? If you happen to have a floor drain nearby, that definitely works, but there's a downside because it's literally an unlimited amount of water that can go down the drain. So if your protein skimmer decides to go bonkers and it is draining gallons of water over the next three or four hours, let's say it drains 15, 18, 24 gallons of water out of your system straight into a floor drain, you don't even know because it's dead silent. It's just draining away. And then when you, and your top off is turning on and adding more water as quickly as possible and salinity in your aquarium is dropping like a rock. That's all bad. I mean, we don't want any of that to happen. So it's much better to have some kind of a system like this, for example, that can disable when it's reached a certain amount. You know, losing a gallon or a gallon and a half from my tank is nothing. If I had this on a five gallon bucket, which by the way, I've done that before. One time uh, I was trying to deal with the skimmer overflowing after using ChemiClean and this wasn't big enough. <laughs> it would fill up so fast that I took a five gallon bucket and I took a clamp and I stuck it on the side of the bucket to create a little lip and I set this right on top of the five gallon bucket and when the thing hit about four and a half gallons, this thing came up and it stopped my protein skimmer. I dumped the bucket out, put the bucket back, put the lid on top. So it made my life a little bit easier in that scenario and didn't have to really make any changes other than get a bigger vessel under my apparatus. Hey Jake, thanks very much. He says that was a great live stream about photography with Reef Dudes the other day. Yeah, I uh, did a stream with him on Wednesday evening and we talked about iPhone photography. And I told Devin he had to ban anyone that had Android. And you know, of course, he would never do that because he's Canadian, he's nice. And I was completely joking. But it was funny to me because both he and I both use iPhones. And I just said, you know, we, we just cannot be talking about Android phones on this stream. There's just no way. So he... Um, he ended up talking about everything. You know, he he was being as all inclusive as you could be, and I was all iPhone, <laughs> like a fanboy. When really, it's just it's my experience. I've been using iPhone now for so long, and I've actually never owned an Android phone. And I've just I've literally my whole household has just become Apple dominant, and everything talks to everything. It's really nice. So I just have zero experience to even talk about anything. And when someone hands me an Android phone to show them how to do something. I'm not really sure I can, but if I can show them on my phone next to them, they're like, oh, and they'll find some similar setting and they can kind of mimic what I was explaining. But I was really hoping we could do more of a, a physical tutorial. And I think the only way to do a really good tutorial of showing exactly how to use, you know, my iPhone, for example, to take pictures, take video and edit and all that is to have someone stand right over my shoulder and film the back of my phone as I'm doing what I'm doing so you can just literally see step by step what I did and I, th I think that could work because that way you're literally seeing what I'm tapping uh, sometimes when you do like a screen share or you a screen grab you may be able to tell what was tapped or not but maybe not and I'm not making massive changes it's actually a pretty simple uh, approach that I've been using for many years and so anyway we talked about a lot of different things to consider when it comes to taking pictures with your phones so be sure to check out his stream on Reef Dudes Uh, Macy's Daddy, yeah, it does have an area on the top here to put carbon. It's probably good for a month at a time, but it just seemed like it was a hassle and just kind of messy, and I had to be careful not to spill any of the grains out the top, and so I just decided not to do it. It just wasn't that important to me. Uh, Smoking Reefer says, I'm in the market for a new skimmer because I have the 220-gallon upgrade. Uh, what do you think is the best skimmer for the money without breaking the bank? I really like the NIO skimmer. I keep pushing the NIO skimmer because it works great for me and it's dead silent. And those two things are what sold me out in the first place. When I first tried it out, of course, I wasn't sure how I'd feel about it because I was really attached to my Euro Reef skimmer, which is old school. And the NIOS uses very little power. It's super easy to adjust. It's relatively easy to clean. And uh, I mean, I've had one running for four years. I've had another one running for about three. But that, that one that's been running for three, it's the smallest one, and I want to go one version up. So I would recommend that you get um, 
like maybe the NIOS 220, I think is the number I'm thinking of. That skimmer is probably around 800. There's one version down that's a little bit less, like 500, but I don't know if that'll be good enough for your size tank. Hey, Scott, thanks very much for placing an order. Yeah, I've been trying very hard to uh, keep things in my inventory. All right, uh, so let me change to the next thing I wanted to talk about, because now it's just lots of questions about everything except waste collectors. But that was fun, right? So we got some information about that. Now, the next topic is me coming across this when I was at Lowe's. And I, you know, who gets excited about a bucket but me? <laughs> I'm just walking down the aisle looking for a new outlet for a, a switch that burned up in my kitchen and I happen to see these buckets and I was like, are you kidding me? Is that a two gallon bucket? That is amazing. So I bought two. Why did I get a two gallon bucket? Why on earth does anyone need that? Well, this is a food grade bucket that is perfect for using safety stop. And safety stop is something that I've been using for every new fish I put in my tank for, I don't know, since 2011. Whenever this came out, I started using it and never stopped. And this is a two-part bath where you take a gallon of tank water with one part. You know, the, this is part A, the green stuff, it's formalin. And you put in a gallon in your bucket and you pour this in. And then you put your fish in with an air stone and a small heater to maintain temperature. And it stays in there for 45 minutes. And I had a one-gallon bucket. Well, that's great, except the bucket was full to the top. And I always was worried that the fish would jump out of that bucket. And I didn't want to use a five gallon bucket because then there's about this much water in the bottom of the bucket. It's really deep down. You can't see what you're doing. I wanted something that was more concise. So what I, and like I said before, if the bucket was really small and I did it anyway, I would put that bucket inside a bigger bucket and I'd add more water around it, like a water skirt. And that way, if the fish were to jump out, it was still in water, wouldn't die, you know? So, I mean, that was my thing. But with this size bucket, I can fill it up halfway get my one gallon in there and there's still plenty of wall to keep the fish from jumping out in theory. You can still throw a screen top on the top if you feel the need, if you're worried about a, a jump. But normally when the fish are in safety stop, they just stay down there. <laughs> I just realized this thing's, it's invisible. That's funny. Um, that is hilarious. The green screen's working great today. Oh, I got an idea. Nope, that didn't work either. That's funny. All right, well anyway, you've got your green side and you got your blue side. And one's formalin, the other one is methylene blue. And with this size bucket, which I think they were like $3 a piece, get yourself two of these buckets, get yourself three if you want, and you can have one for acclimation, one for part A, one for part B, and your fish will be nice and safe, and it doesn't cost you much. And I just wanted to tell you guys about this. I've actually been wanting to tell you about this for about three or four weeks, and I kept forgetting to bring a bucket over here near the camera when I was on screen. So now I've done it. It's off my to-do list. I feel a lot better. All right. Uh, let's scroll up and see what else we've got here. Uh, Tim says, I'd love to have you talk about different corals you keep and enjoy and what all you know about them as tips for success. Um, yeah, I mean, I've always, I've, you know, your idea is not a, a bad idea. I just was thinking if I point the camera at a certain coral and just talk about it and then go to the next one, it kind of felt like a boring documentary to me. I want it to be interesting. I don't know. Uh, maybe I can make it actually interesting. I know I've done specific streams talking about... Uh, LPS corals, talking about SPS corals. Um, I've probably gone into corals you want to avoid as, you know, like three different topics that you could probably watch. But like an edited video, maybe talking about certain ones might be interesting. I don't really know. I mean, it really, sometimes the audience follows for knowledge and sometimes the audience follows like a fan base and they just want to know everything about you. And so if you said, hey man, I love hammer corals, all of a sudden they're like, oh my God, this is the topic I've been waiting to hear. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to know who's gonna who you're gonna reach total in the audience and is it gonna work out but uh, yeah I mean I've, I've it's on my list it'll probably happen at some point so thanks for asking let's see Uh, Gary says, I saw in a post you stated that the pulse power pump routines could shorten the life of an aquarium. Can you explain this? Yeah, um, back in the day, the, when, uh, like for example, the Vortec pump came out, 
they would show it at Macna and different uh, events like that, Reef of Palooza, for example, and there'd be this huge wave just rocking back and forth in the aquarium. And Tunzi, matter of fact, Tunzi came out with one before that called the Tunzi Wave Box. And it was a box that you hung in the corner of your tank, and there was a pump inside the box, and the pump would turn on and off at a rapid succession, and it would suck water into the box and then push it out and push it in and push it. And this routine would create a wave moving back in the aquarium. Well, the big concern was that if you're running a wave, if the tank is literally rocking on the stand, how long is the silicone going to hold? And so manufacturers started stating, if you're going to use your tank in wave mode, you'll probably short the lifespan of the aquarium by 20%. So if you have a five-year aquarium, it'll probably be good for four years. If you have a 10-year aquarium, it's gonna be good for eight years. It's just something to keep in mind because you are putting stress on the box of glass that is designed to sit stationary and you're doing something, let's call it unique. You don't see freshwater people doing wave action. You know, it's only a saltwater people that does it. <laughs> so uh, I j it's just a potential risk that could happen. Now myself, I don't enjoy looking at wave action. I have no desire. I've never had my tank. I tried for like one week or two to actually create a wave in my tank. I was like, this is stupid. I don't even care. And some people really enjoy watching the corals just do this back and forth. You know, that's just their thing. Or they even watch the fish moving back and forth in the water column, but they're not swimming. That's just not for me. So, but that is basically the concern is that it could actually affect the seams and make the tank come apart. Uh, Nick says, I bought a huge rainbow bubble tip anemone yesterday that's approximately 10 to 12 inches, and it planted itself right over a 3-inch one that's below it. Should I worry about it? They're both bubble tip anemones. In theory, it should be okay, but what may happen is that the big one could shadow the little one so much that the little one just shrinks even more. Or maybe the little one will move to a new spot now, so you're going to have two different ones wandering around in your tank. Make sure that you cover any intakes of any power heads so that they don't, uh, the anemone doesn't get sucked in. It's really, really important. But yeah, bubble tips should be okay with each other. Uh, Teflon says, I'm currently building my first seawater pool. It's 500 liters and I have cats. Do I have to pay attention so that the cats are not endangered? I had a freshwater pool for 10 years. Yeah, uh, cats do dumb things, including falling into aquariums. And so if you have an open body of water, there's a good chance the cat could end up in there at some point. And as long as he can get back out, that's the first part of the battle. But uh, most people that own cats, I'm not a cat owner, but most people that own cats have covers on their tank of some kind to protect it. And you may need some kind of a cover on top of this pool that you're setting up. Uh, Raul says, do you feel the need to clean the collection cup since you have the auto neck cleaner and external container? No, exactly. I don't have to clean the cup nearly as much as I used to. I used to clean it every day because it was sort of like, I would tell people, why would you not clean the collection cup every day? Do you flush the toilet every day? And they're like, well, yeah. I was like, well, it's the same thing. So that was my, like I said, it was my routine. But when things got automated, I found that I didn't need to clean it as much. And if anything, I've probably gotten a little bit more lazy about it. Uh, in the recent you know, few weeks, I've been more on top of taking the cup off and cleaning it. I don't even know why. I just suddenly did. Uh, Art of War says, do you plan to come back to Riverhead Aquarium? Uh, it'd be great. You know, I haven't, I'm not going anywhere. I have one trip that is a sudden spur of the moment trip that's happening this week um, that I'm going to go see my mother. Um, I haven't talked about it publicly, but she's... Uh, She's near the end of her life, and so I'm going to go see her now before things are worse. And uh, so I'm planning to just drive because I want to limit my exposure to catching the virus. So I feel it's safer for me to just get my car and get out occasionally to fill up a gas tank than to deal with everything that happens in airports and uh, baggage claims and Ubers or taxis or rental cars. I have no idea who's touched anything before I get in. I can't control that environment nearly as much as I want to, and I just would rather not get it, and I'd rather definitely not carry it into my mother's home. So i am uh, got plans this week to just head out and just go see her while I still can. Uh, 
Um, Renee says, do you know what's in the DNA of coral? Nope. Uh, Graham says, are branded all-in-one tanks worth it? Branded? You mean like some certain company makes it? Um, I think all-in-one tanks can be nice. I think they're great for someone who wants a simple setup. And the only thing is the limitation is you may not have enough room in the back to do some of the things you want. But if you can use it out of the box the way it's designed and keep it really simple, you could probably have a nice little simple ecosystem. It might be, you know, all-in-ones tend to be small, usually. And in those scenarios, a lot of people tend to stick to almost making it a species tank rather than a full-on reef. I mean, anyone can do anything. I've seen people make a reef in a, in a vase. So, I mean, it, anything can be done. But if you're trying to make your life simple, then an all-in-one tank, it can be very nice convenience. You don't have to deal with sumps. You don't have to worry about things draining. But you're having to top off manually. Or you've got to set up some kind of automated system. I mean, I'm all about automation, so it can be done. But are they worth it? Yeah, yeah I think so. I had a friend who really wanted a very special custom tank, and he was so frustrated he didn't have it. He says, man, I just want this tank, and I feel like it's so long out. I said, just get yourself a small tank now. And he basically followed my advice, went to the fish store, bought himself something cute that probably held, I don't know, 15, 19 gallons or something. Set it up, got some rock in there, hooked up a bunch of gear, got a really cool light on top, got some stuff from me, um, got some of my anemones, some of my clownfish. And uh, he had this beautiful little ecosystem. He says, I have never been happier. He said, that was the best advice you ever gave me. And I was happy for him because he no longer had to wait for a tank. And I even did a stream about this probably a year ago where I said, Stop waiting, set up a tank today. <laughs> Beast Beak says, so are you the other reef dude? You know, I have been asking him for years who the other dude is, and he keeps saying he's going to tell us, and he's never done it. I just feel like there's some huge story that we're being left out of. Uh, reef Keeper says, I still have the Euro Reef CS6-2 skimmer in my garage. I forgot all about it until you mentioned it. I still have my old skimmer in my back room, because technically, if the Nios died, I'd have a backup skimmer. I don't know that I want to run it. I don't know if it will run, but I cleaned it really well before I stored it. But, uh, you know, I don't know if those Eheim pumps are even going to come back on when it's time. Sergeant, Sergeant Gingerbread says, gave me a super chat. Thank you very much. And he said, started watching this channel 24 months ago. From the start, I managed to catch up to the latest video this week. <laughs> I have learned a phenomenal amount. My first tank is ready to go. Thanks, Mark. Wow. Um, I'm thinking you probably heard the same stuff over so many times during that. Uh, Andrea took the time the other day to figure out exactly how many hours on my channel has been live stream only. And I thought it was going to be more. I thought it would be something insane, but it really wasn't. And I think it ended up being something like 11,000 minutes, which isn't a lot. And uh, it kind of averaged out to like each stream was about an hour and 45 minutes or maybe it was an hour and 25 minutes I, I she said in the beginning you had these short ones and then one day you hit two and then you never looked back and now it's like two hours long three hours long four hours long you know you're like i'm never going to a short one again but there are times where i do need to do a short stream and you know i was doing some streams to facebook for a little while not videos but streams and they've changed some stuff in how you have to do it so i've found it to be overly complicated. I was like, man, I just I can just hook this up and go. I mean, I say that. There's a little more effort in making this work. Uh, where's my phone? Oh, I was gonna take a picture to show you guys. But um, this room right now took me about 30 minutes to set up because I was trying to put a green screen behind me and I wanted to have the area here for a table to put things on and have the computer. Anyway, it was a, I've got three lights running around me. And, uh, but, I thought, well, if I can do this relatively simply, just set it up, why can't I just do the same thing on Facebook? But there was some kind of, I needed some kind of plug-in, and it just wasn't, it wasn't like just turn on and go, which I'm so used to doing here. I mean, once I've got all the, the room set up, I can just go ahead and hit start. And with Facebook, there was something more involved, so I haven't done it. But I used to. I used to grab my phone and just stream from the workshop or stream from my desk or whatever, and I haven't done that in a while. So you guys on YouTube are getting spoiled. Steve Minns says, there are not many all-in-one tanks in the UK. I'm getting on a bit and don't want an under-tank sump. So I'm thinking about making a rear sump from acrylic. You could put a sump behind the tank. It is possible, and you could actually make it bigger. 
you could actually make a large enough unit behind the tank to where you could fit a regular protein skimmer for, you know, if you forgive my uh, tone, I'm not trying to say that other skimmers aren't any good, but it gives you some flexibility to have something a little bit larger, a little bit beefier. There's room for maybe one or two reactors to run GFO or carbon, or maybe you want to go bio pellets, or maybe you want to have a, a top off reservoir in the back as well to replenish water as it evaporates. I mean, there's all these things you can do. Comes down, and if you can do it behind, you could essentially pump out of the tank and drain back into the tank if you make it a little taller than the tank. If you want to drain out the back of the tank, you're going to put a hole in the back of that all-in-one or whatever tank you've got and drain out, and then you've got to push it in. I mean, somehow the water has to keep flowing, and gravity will be involved. The uh, <laughs> This T-shirt actually has a story. So I know it looks a little bit weird, but uh, what it is, it's state of Texas, obviously. But on this, this is actually a tornado. And what it is, it's from the Texas Storm Chasers. And they go all over the, you know, the, the state looking for what's happening and reporting it. And they have a Facebook page. And uh, you know they have notifications to your phone. And at one point, they were doing a fundraiser, and I bought a t-shirt. I was like, I got to have that shirt. So I've had it ever since. It's very rare that I have a shirt that doesn't have a story behind it. Uh, Adam says, I'll be ordering baffles from you as soon as I can get through this COVID thing. Question for you, do you cut panels for 7-inch socks as well? A panel? Do you mean some kind of a bracket you can set a 7-inch diameter sock into? Yeah, I can make that. That's not a problem. Uh, Smoking Reefer says, I took your advice on cyano... Um, he's talking about red cyano RX. Uh, it works fantastic. 99% is gone. Not sure if it's totally gone. Shall I give it another dose, or can this be harmful? I don't want to push my luck. It's the last day um, today. <laughs> um, if it's 99% gone, you probably can just be happy. But I, yeah, I think that's it. I think I would let it go. I'd do your big water change, and I would then deal with the protein skimmer overflowing and drain as much of that as you can and replace that water with a new salt water. Uh, B Speak says, why do you sell the snail guard for the Nero 5, but you don't sell the pump? The guys that sell the pump don't sell the guard. Uh, the reason I sell the guard is because someone that 3D printed that said, Mark, I'm looking to sell these. And I said, I'll sell them. <laughs> That's why I have the guard. Now, the reason I haven't sold the Nero 5 is as an AI product, and I sell Ecotech products. And for me to sell AI products, I have to buy like thousands of dollars of AI products to get on the shelf just to get some of their products. And I just haven't had the desire to put that much money sitting on the shelf, hoping that maybe I'll sell some pumps. So that is the honest answer. Now, would it be possible I could possibly go into that direction, start getting some AI products and put them on the website? Yeah, because I've been running my Nero 5. I love it, and I like to sell the things I use. It's just been a matter of where can I get it where I don't have to buy, I don't know, 50 pumps. You know, If I could buy 10 to put on my site, I'd do it. Andy Rude says, I'm in the market to buy a new return pump. Should I buy two pumps, one for the UV chiller, one for the tank, or one big pump to do both? I like to have two pumps for that situation where one is the return pump dedicated to get the water back up to the tank and the other one for all the accessory equipment. That's what I like to do. Because if you're running it to like a chiller and a UV and your tank and you turn off the return pump because you want to keep food in the tank, Water is no longer flowing through the UV. Water is no longer flowing through the chiller. Either of those pieces of equipment could potentially be damaged because there's no flow going through them. If you could, at the same time the return pump is off, disable the chiller and the UV, like all three are turned off with the same button you push, that would work. But you also are going to have to dial the right, the right amount of flow to each one of these and still have enough flow left over to feed your tank. So... Actually, what I really want you to do is I want you to buy three pumps. <laughs> I want you to have a return pump. I want you to have the accessory pump that can do your UV, your chiller, your reactors. And I want you to have a third one that's on the shelf for if your return pump fails, you can swap it out with a new one and keep your return pump going. Ah, 
Um, Raul says bre brewery supply shops also have the two gallon buckets in case you can't find them in the big box stores. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, someone mentioned there's lots of sales this weekend. It's a holiday weekend here in the US. Uh, Monday is Memorial Day, uh, which means I can't ship anything. <laughs> But uh, there's a lot of sales that are going out. There's been a lot of emails coming in saying, buy our stuff, it's on sale. Tim says, what SPS do you recommend that are very hardy and usually grow well for beginners? Also, do you find that Gorgonians are difficult? Uh, so the first question, Bird's Nest is a great beginner coral. It's an SPS coral and it comes in four or five different colors, two or three different styles and they're very, they grow quickly so you can actually see that you're doing a good job. And so I really like them for that. And they're relatively hardy, but they do die quickly. You know, if something goes wrong, the whole thing goes up in smoke, like, like cotton candy is just gone. Yesterday was great, today it's gone. So that can be a little bit frustrating, but I still wouldn't say don't get that coral because of that. Uh, I have bird's nest in my tank right now. I've got three or four different kinds in my reef, and they're all just kind of doing their thing, and they're pretty. But uh, they're great beginner coral. Another good SPS coral that I like is the Pacillopora. And people always say, oh, don't get Pacillopora because it'll spread and, and put babies in your reef. Never happened to me. Not once. Not with all the different ones I had. I just had a nice little colony that grew. But they do have the ability to throw a bud and that polyp will land somewhere else. And I like I was watching someone's video recently. I forget who it was. And he was showing his tank. I'm trying to think who it was. Eh. Anyway, he had some Pacillopora growing on the, uh, the flow accelerator where the water's shooting into the tank. It was just growing a little colony right there, and a little mini colony. It was really cute. And, you know, he didn't put it there. It found its own way there and landed there and stuck and started growing. So there is a chance you may end up with more Pacillopora than you want. I don't really consider that a bad thing unless it's everywhere. And, of course, you can always just break it off of that spot and put it back where you need it. So I don't see that as a deal breaker. So those are the ones I recommend. Then you asked about Gorgonians. Are they hard? If you can get a photosynthetic gorgonian, which means it is part of its fuel or intake is light, that's going to be a lot easier than a non-photosynthetic gorgonian because the non-photosynthetic ones have to be fed. You have to be on top of it. You got to, you know, whatever you're going to do, whether it's Ben Reef or phytoplankton or uh, reefroids or any of these different products that, you know, we can mix up and pour in the tank for broadcast feeding, that would be how you're going to keep them alive. But the photosynthetic ones, they just seem to be bulletproof. You know, they'll just live. I mean, I've had the same one now going for eight years, and it grew from, you know, three little tiny fingers. And I've cut off several branches. I shipped a, a branch to someone recently. He was determined to have a piece, so I sent him one in, in his order. But no, I don't think they're difficult. <laughs> Estonian Reefer says, Do those two gallon buckets mean you'll buy more fish soon? Eh, there's maybe, it could happen, but at least now I'm prepared if I suddenly get a hankering for a new fish. Um, and then he asked, uh, are you, how's the cleaner rest doing? Consuelo is doing quite well. It's amazing. And he is constantly cleaning the other fish. I've watched it go up and clean the antheus, the yellow tang, the purple tang, always following Spock like a remora. It's crazy. And uh, Spock just tolerates it. It's kind of amazing. But sometimes that cleaner rest nibbles a little too hard and Spock turns on a dime like, I will kill you if you do that again. So uh, it's a good relationship and it's kind of amazing. And then when I put nori on the clip and hang it on the glass, I will watch the cleaner rascal come up and eat a whole bunch of nori. So I've, I've been really lucky with that one. Remember, when I introduced that in my tank, I don't know when it was, whenever the video was published, I was really concerned it wouldn't live because historically, they don't do well in reef tanks. I mean, eventually you'll get a good one, but there's a there's more chance of it not working out than working out. And I, I don't know why that is. Uh, by the way, this week I shared a really cool story about... Um, it's either Heniocus or Moorish Idols. And I shared it on the Mila's Reef page on Facebook. So... This one. So go right here. I'm putting it right on my face. That page, if you're not following that page right now, you're missing out. <laughs> Every day I share something. Um, typically a nice set of pictures from my friend in Bonaire, or it'll be, an, uh, there was a really cool um, video that someone shared of their tank, 
or in this case, there was this interview that Matt Peterson of Coral Magazine did with this fish breeder in Florida who has kept alive this group of fish, which I think was 15 of them, for 20 plus months, when normally you're lucky to keep them alive a few months. And he has had this group not only living, but they're thriving, and they're only eating one food that he puts in the tank. It's, I think it was New Era Pellet. It's in the, in the article. And this guy is like, I mean, usually the only people that can keep these fish alive are public aquariums. And this guy has been able to do it in a, uh, I read this three days ago, 200 gallon tank, 400 gallon tank. And there's only like a couple of other fish, but it's a whole bunch of that one species that's so hard to keep alive. And he's keeping them alive with his own brand of food. And that was a really cool story. And uh, it proved that his food is really good. So, all right. Uh, JB23 Guitar says, you mentioned using half a cup of carbon per gallon. How many grams is that? I don't know. I live in the United States. We use ounces. And even then, I've never weighed my carbon. I just do a half a cup at a time. I apologize. There has got to be some kind of conversion on the web where you can use Google and find out what a half cup weighs. Or at some point, I can weigh it and tell you in ounces what it weighs. And then you can convert it to grams. <laughs> And I like to make fun of metric only because I, I did grow up in Switzerland, so obviously I, I understand the metric system, but I'm American, and so we don't use the metrics over here. Even my moderators and I get into it back and forth, and they're like, oh, but metric is so great. And I'm like, no, it's not. It's stupid. And a lot of times I'm just joking around, guys. Um, Insane Reefer says, what are your thoughts on DKH dropping 0.2 points daily? I only have two acros and three zoas in my 180 gallon tank. I am currently running a calcium reactor. Um, dropping 0.2 and then rising 0.2 and dropping 0.2 and rising 0.2 is not a problem. If it's dropping 0.2 and then dropping 0.2 and then dropping 0.2 and then, in other words, in five days, is it down one DKH? That's a problem. But since you've got a calcium reactor running, Ideally, you're supposed to kind of, you know, it's going to fluctuate some, but you only have two little tiny corals. So in theory, your calcium reactor hasn't quite dialed into the sweet spot. When you're there, it's going to pretty much stay. Like, for example, it could be 9.0 week after week after week after week after week. And then, you know, you might see a little fluctuation, especially as the media gets used up. Matter of fact, that's one of the things I have to do this weekend. I need to look at my calcium reactor to make sure everything's clean and running well because it looks like the effluent, which is the liquid coming out of it, is slowing down, and I'm not sure why. So I want to make sure that it's not a problem because I don't want my tank to suffer and not have enough alkalinity. Uh, Jose Luis says, what are you sipping on today? I'm sipping on coffee because it's early in the day. And it's cooling off much too quickly. Um, Tim says, have you ever heard of bacteria from carbon dose and it can eat phosphate? Are they also eaten by corals? Can it help with their growth, which in turn help them utilize more nitrate? Eh, no. Um, I'm not really familiar with all of that. I mean, some of the stuff I read once kind of got the gist of it and just said, okay, and now I can move on with my life. And I have done carbon dosing in the past, like dosing vodka. And the plan for that was mainly to remove nitrate. And then, you know, if uh, once that was done, then it would start removing phosphate. <clears throat> in my own case, when I've done carbon dosing, I've seen, well, when I didn't vodka, I did it. It took a long time, but it did it. Um, but then I've tried other carbon dosing where my phosphates would drop like a rock, but my nitrate didn't even budge, which was really weird. It's, it's always nitrate first and then phosphate. And for some reason, my system was like, no, no, we're going to get rid of all that nasty phosphate. <laughs> and it became a problem and corals started to suffer, so I stopped. Um, but... Could the carbon, see what carbon dosing basically does, like I said, I'm not the chemist on this one. I would actually have to defer this to an article that was written in Reefkeeping Magazine a long time ago that I consider to be the Bible when it comes to carbon dosing. That's where they explained it in way too much detail. But the essential nugget of it that I got from the, the full write-up was that by dosing carbon to your tank, you're increasing the bacteria level in your tank to a higher percentage. So like, let's say you don't carbon dose and your tank has 100% bacteria. And then you carbon dose 
and now you're at 105% bacteria and you dose that steady amount and stay at 105. And then you increase slightly and you're now you're at like 107%. And then, you know, I'm just using random numbers here, but the point is as you carbon dose and the more you put in the tank, the more you're overcharging the bacteria, you're putting in more bacteria in the tank than it normally would have. And they are feeding off of that carbon dosing, which allows them to help consume uh, more waste in the system is the, the principle behind it. Oh, thank you, Andrea. <laughs> 10,791 minutes of live stream. And she went to, that was a lot of trouble to go through all that because this is our 131st live stream and not all of them started with the phrase, let's talk about. So she had to do a little bit of guesswork on them. <laughs> Mr. Ezzy says, I started vodka dosing today and the fish seem a lot friendlier. Um, Trevor says, what are your thoughts on Cyphastria as a beginner coral? Yeah, the meteor shower is very pretty, pretty relatively simple to keep. Um, they're not demanding, they're slow growing, they're very pretty. That would be a good one. Uh, Dan says, I want an anemone. What lighting would you recommend? Would a Kessel A160 be enough? Thank you. Depends on the size of the aquarium and the location of the anemone. The 160 might be enough. The uh, 360 would probably be better. And the 360X would be awesome. Uh, so Tim, to continue what you asked before, this is not one of those topics that I'm good at. And so he said, you know, supposedly the corals have a good mechanism for removing nitrate, but poor for phosphate uptake. This is the reef active topic I heard Lou talking about. See, Lou is who you should be talking to about this, not me. And several of you have said, hey, have you, you know, heard Lou's talk? I have not. I just haven't. I've had people say, haven't you heard this? Haven't you heard that? I haven't had the time. I, um, I do get to watch some TV, but I find myself working all the time. And, uh, I, someone shared a really cool video today or last night at one in the morning on his YouTube channel. It's like a five minute video. And he says, hey, your stand has no woodwork around it. And so it inspired me because mine doesn't have any either. So I've done the woodwork and I've filmed it to hopefully inspire you to close your tank up as well. So I watched his video. He did a really nice job. So it's in Club Meals Reef if you want to check it out. And the, the one thing I was concerned about if I were to do woodwork is I want the paint to be glossy or even matte, but it needs to be streak free. I don't want runs or drips. And his panels were phenomenal. I mean, they looked like a painted car. And I was watching, I was like, how the heck did he paint it that nicely? And then he said he couldn't do that. So he sent it to a professional for them to do it. And I was like, ah, that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> so technically if I were to make my woodwork, I could then give it to somebody and let them shoot it and like, you know, somebody that does this stuff for a living and make it nice and pretty. He did say it was not cheap, which I'm sure is true, but his tank looked so much nicer with a, a nice skirt wrapped around it, so to speak. And he did a really cool cutout for his electrical that was not a rectangle, it was not a circle. It was kind of this, the shape of a house and uh, it looked really, really nice. It's someone from over in Europe because they had the weird, uh, uh, the weird plugs that I'm not used to seeing here. So I do try to watch some videos, but I've not heard Lou's talk. So you guys keep asking me, have you heard Lou's talk? I have not. And you keep asking me, have you tried Bioactive? No, I don't know anything about it. And the only way I ever will is when I finally have the time. Now maybe during my super long drive, I can play the YouTube video in the background and listen, perhaps. Uh, Maker of Things says, I'm finally catching a live stream. I just sat down after replacing, redrilling, and installing a cracked tank twice. Hell of a day. Well, you are the maker of things, so it makes sense that you would do it two or three times, right? That sucks, though. No, seriously, when a tank cracks, it's the worst. Uh, so I'm glad you're getting some time to just relax and put that behind you. Uh, Scott says, I moved to a house a month ago, and tomorrow I need to set up the RODI system. It's been a month with no water changes. It has me scared, so please wish me luck. Well, good luck. Um, I, you're talking to a guy that barely does water changes, so I don't think you have to worry too much, but definitely get the RO system running. If it's been sitting unused for at least a month, I would at the very least run it for an hour to get every drop of water out of it because it's stagnant. And then 
start collecting water for your aquarium, but I would not just turn it on and start using that water immediately. Uh, Gold Slinger says, are you monetized on YouTube? Yeah, I turned on monetization a long time ago. And so that's why you see one or two little ads inside my videos. Sometimes, and th it's just completely automated. All I do is just turn it on, you know, as a feature, and then they choose where to put them. And sometimes in the past, they will put way too many ads in like a, a three hour live stream. And so I went ahead and I uh, went into the editor and I had to pull out the extras only because someone said there's way too many commercials. And I looked and it was like 14. I was like, what? So I, I sucked them out to where there was like one every 20 minutes or so. But yeah, I, I set that up a while back. I think it's time to change the background. Let's go with this. There's me. And since I'm looking off to the side, I should flip this so my picture's backwards. Nah, I'm just gonna leave it, I don't care. Um, Raheem says, I'm a beginner to saltwater tank. Which corals or fish are best? All right, Raheem, what I want you to do is this. I want you to do some reading. So, you are going to go trim this down a little bit. All right, so you are going to go to my website and at the top here of the website you are going to see well actually right here on the front page, let me get on here. If you scroll down it says new to saltwater, start here, click that. And then Right here it says, I want to start a saltwater tank. I want you to read that article. And inside that article are a bunch of sub-articles that are all linked to give you a ton of information. And I want you to read and read and read before you spend any money whatsoever. And if you do all of that like I'm asking you to do, you will be very happy. And if you choose to just rush into this without doing that, you'll regret it. So I want to really emphasize education over um, spending. So it's not about what's the best fish, what's the best coral. It's about setting up the right ecosystem in the first place and then doing research on what fish and corals you'd like to make sure they're compatible to get things that are reef safe or maybe you're wanting a predator tank that's saltwater because you want to feed something like you want to feed an octopus shrimp, for example. Maybe that's your thing. 
And so when you're trying to choose, like you said, fish and coral, so I'm thinking reef tank, not species tank. But at the same time, for me to say, just get some clownfish and get an anemone and, and get, you know, gorgonian and get, you know, some mushrooms, that, it's a disservice to you. I'd much rather you learn more and learn about creatures. And uh, there's a whole critter ID section on my website that has all pictures of all kinds of corals and fish. You can look at the pictures and read little tiny synopsises of each one to see if anything appeals to you, to see if it's a good choice or not. <laughs> uh, Scott says, of course, see, I say something and somebody discounts it immediately. He says, um, my bio cube was overrun with bacilla pour. I thought it was cool at first, but it's killing many of my other corals. Well, yeah, like I said, you might have to trim them. And uh, if you have to trim and remove, like sell the frags to the fish store, sell the frags to other people, throw them away. I mean, that happens too. If you have too much of something and no one, no one to give it to, then you just do that. But I would suggest that uh, you do keep it under control so it doesn't sting other corals. It is a very hardy coral. But like I said, in my case, it never spread abundantly. It was just one colony. Uh, Unfiltered Reefer, thank you very much for the super chat and I appreciate your thoughts and prayers. Uh, yeah, there's, there's nothing can be done. So it's... Uh, it's been, I, I, don't, I don't really want to get into it on YouTube, but I can just tell you that two days ago I had a really bad day and it was really hard for me to focus. It was really hard for me to accomplish anything. And uh, it was just reality sinking in. So I, um, I'm just going to have to make this trip immediately. Um, Abe says, my brother and I just bought a 125 gallon tank with double overflows drilled and a custom 40 gallon sump. Anywho, I'm kind of intimidated about plumbing it. Any tips or advice? I actually have an article on Reef Addicts, which is my other website. It's called Plumbing 101. And so you can go to Google and type in Plumbing 101, Milev. And if you need to, you can go site colon reefaddicts.com. It'll take you right to my article. And you can learn everything you need to know about plumbing in that one. I've done some stuff about plumbing on this channel, but it's not enough to me, for me to point you to it. That article is really all-inclusive. It covers a lot. And I have a separate article on that. So reefaddicts.com has a bunch of articles. Definitely check out those articles. I have one about how to how to buy and install pro, uh, bulkheads, which you're going to be using as well. Plumbing should... It, it's tedious. It can feel a little overwhelming. It's always more expensive than you think. But once it's done, it's done. I mean, just think about it. The house that you're in or the apartment you're in, someone did plumbing. And that's it forever. I mean, until something finally breaks, it's there for years and years and years. This house that I'm in is very old. And while I've replaced some stuff over the years, some of the original plumbing is still in this house. So like anything, things do break at some point. But setting up the plumbing and doing it right is, uh, you know, it's a skill. It's important. But it's just tedious because... You can't just do it in a couple of hours. Normally, you're going to be at it for like half a day. Or you might even say, today we're going to do drains. Tomorrow, I'm going to do returns. And uh, that's, that's how I do it. I don't want to do it all at once. It's exhausting. When I had to replace the 400-gallon sump, and that's a video on this channel that showed a lot of plumbing. You could check that out. Um, it took a while to get the old sump out, get everything disconnected, haul it outside, slide in the brand new one without scuffing it and then hooking up all the plumbing. And I spent probably nine or 11 hours plumbing it to get everything connected, and that sucked. <laughs> but the reason it's, it takes so long is when you take two pieces and you put them together, you, you put your primer on there and then you put your solvent on, on both parts and you press it together and twist and hold, you have to hold that for one minute. And then you go to the next item and you do the same thing again. And this is um, one minute at a time. So it can take a long time to get it done. Uh, Rule says, I got a cool tool from Home Depot too. It's the bucket head. Yeah, it's a shop vac that you can snap on the top of a five gallon bucket and you have a, a little shop vac, which is great if you're only sucking out, you know, less than five gallons. If it's a big mess, you might be emptying it out several times until you finally get rid of all the water that went everywhere. Uh, Smoking Reefer says, I've got Tang Wars going on. I've tried feeding more. Blackout, Mirror Trick is working a bit, but frightened to take it away. Myself and uh, Prototype is beat up. Do you have any other tricks? Um, 
sometimes what you have to do when you have fish that are really squabbling is you've got to go ahead and remove the fish both of them you know the ones fighting and put them in a separate system rearrange the rock work in your tank and then a few days later put the fish back in because when they go back their territories are all messed up and they may be more busy focused on um, establishing new territorial space rather than fighting one another but you may have fish that are uh, natural enemies too so you need to find out if these tanks are even compatible you didn't say what the other one was you just said the sailfin was going to beat up it could be you have two similar shaped fish like for example the sailfin the purple tang and the yellow tang all basically have the same body shape even though the sailfin can be so much taller but it's that shape and so typically when you're combining tangs in a tank it's best to have one shape is the hippo tang another shape is the yellow tang another shape is the dusamiri um, that is going to be less likely to have aggression because they are not the same shape fish Uh, the Grim Reefer says, my bird's nest doing well at the bottom that doesn't get any light dies. Well, wait a minute. You said it's doing well. Would you frag this? But my Montepore Digitata has STN. Any advice? Well, it sounds like you got some other things going on in the tank. But um, bird's nest will grow up high. Bird's nest will grow down low. And uh, like I said, it can just suddenly die all of a sudden. I only frag a coral when it's done dying. So if it's dying, it's dying. And I just let it go until it falls apart completely. <clears throat> and then whatever life I can find left on it, I'll use that to grow new. Oh, uh, by the way, I've got something really cool happening in my tank right now. And then I'll get back to your STN question. Uh, I've got this walking dendrophilia. A walking dendrophilia is a, um, it's a little coral that has skin going down the sides and the top is open like a flower. And, you know, it, it the reason it's called walking is because there's a worm in the bottom that lives in a tiny hole. And apparently, I've never seen the worm, but the worm comes out of the hole. I guess it's digging down or burrowing down into the sand, I suppose, or going across the surface and burrowing down. And it hooks in, and then it pulls its butt, <laughs> which pulls the coral to the new spot. So you buy this coral that's the size of an olive, and you put it on your sand bed, and then it's just somewhere else in the tank later, but you never see it. The coral doesn't move. It's the worm pulling it. It's really neat. So anyway, the reason I'm telling you this story is because this, I bought two walking dendros probably about two years ago, and there's one on one side of the anemone cube, and there's one on the other side of the anemone cube. And the one on the one side looks totally fine. The one on the other side kind of goes front to back, you know, on the, the available area of sand. And recently it was snuggled up. I mean, literally like touching an Akan Echinata. And Akans are very aggressive corals. They usually they will kill whoever's near them. And I'm looking at that walking dendro, and forget the worm, just the coral itself. I'm thinking, that is amazing that this coral is absolutely unaffected and the Akan does not care when they're literally touching each other. And I was just kind of like shaking my head and I was like, well, I mean, that thing's been in there a year and a half, two years, and it's never had a problem. So nature is marvelous you know it's just that's amazing that nature knows so anyway <laughs> you know i just went through this whole thought process in my brain like that is crazy that these guys are getting along the next day i look at my walking dendro and half of it's dead and i mean it's there's half a polyp and there's like bone white skeleton i'm like no the a can got it i should have moved it you know i just was thinking how are these guys getting along <laughs> they were not that night the a can probably put out its mesenterial filaments and just uh, attacked the heck out of that coral and killed half of it. So I was watching, and of course the thing moved far away from the coral. <laughs> the worm probably realized he made a mistake and took the wrong left turn and says, I gotta get the heck out of here. So he pulled over to this area in the middle of the sand and just sitting there. It didn't move for like three days. And the skeleton was bone white and yet the other half was alive and the polyp was open. And I was like, man, Am I going to have half a coral now? Is this worm just going to carry around half of a living animal on its back from now on? And so I've been just kind of watching it. <clears throat> and within three days, I have observed the back end that died. It's like the tissue is regrowing across and the polyp is spreading down into the core, which would be kind of like the, the mouth area of the skeleton. And I'm just like, wow, that thing is going to heal itself. That is, it's like a Lazarus coral. <laughs> So the walking dendro 
It's really interesting to me right now. And uh, I've taken one or two craptastic pictures, but I'm looking forward to giving you a, a full report later that this coral is completely recovered and that it's fine. There's not really anything I can do specifically to keep it away from that ACAN. I mean, if that dumb thing goes over there again, all I can do is notice and move it manually. But I can't put up a fence necessarily because the worm will just go wherever it wants to go because it's a worm. And it's got worm brain and it wants to do that. Now, uh, back to the Grim Reefer's question about Digitata having STN. STN is slow tissue necrosis, which means dying slowly. Commonly, that's from the bottom up. It is possible for Digitata to die from the bottom but all the top is beautiful. And there have been times in the past where I got frustrated looking at the dead area of my coral on the bottom part. And so I would go in and I would remove the coral from the tank and I would cut off all the dead and re-glue it, basically moving the entire coral lower in the tank. And now I'm not looking at dead white. I'm looking at healthy tissue again. And the coral, because digitata grows up, it doesn't grow down. It almost never grows down because it's a, like a stalactite grow, uh, stalagmite stalagmite growing coral. And while the frag plug might have a frag and puddle out and grow over it to hide the plug, normally once it's done doing that, it just goes up. And so if you have death at the bottom, there's a good chance it'll stay like that and it'll just never change. Now, if it keeps progressing upward, then you definitely have a problem in the tank you need to address. And that could be an alkalinity swing, that could be uh, shading, um, it could be temperature issues. These are all things that happen to us at different times of the year. I can't really predict what's happening in your tank specifically, but it can be a frustrating thing to look at. And uh, STN, I mean, I've got one coral in my tank right now that's got a little bit of that, just one. One SPS, like, it's got some white on the bottom. But there's, a, there's this coral, let's just call this the coral right here. And then I've got this bigger tabling one right above it, and there's all the shade right here. So this part here is dying because there's just no light. It's just doing badly. And the only thing I could do is, like I said, take it out and cut it, but if I cut off the part that's dying and move the coral down, it'll be completely in the shade, which doesn't work either. So I'm just kind of like leaving it alone, letting it be, and letting it be natural. Oh, D says that half a cup equals 64 grams. Thank you very much. My friend is calling me, but I'm live streaming. Can't do it. Oh, okay, Dar okay, thank you for asking this question. Daryl says, have you noticed any nitrate reduction with my turf scrubber? Well, I haven't done my tests yet for today, but last week nitrates were around 40, and um, I'd like to think it's working, but I don't know. But something interesting happened this week that was unexpected. I did post a picture on Instagram where I said to you guys that uh, I created a black shield that fits down inside the drawer that slides in. And I did that on purpose because the bottom of the entire unit was filling up with this, gru this uh, gruesome algae in the bottom. It was just a mess. And I was like, God, you know, I don't want all this down here. I, I, want, I want the turf scrubber to grow algae. I want the bottom part to be clean and just drain water cleanly into, I have a mesh sock underneath to catch any particulates, which it's catching some big stuff. So I'm glad I did that. But I put in that shield and then I put the top piece back on top that has the fabric hanging down and I and I made sure those flow and I slid the drawer back in and I closed it. So two days ago I just pulled out the drawer just, just out of curiosity. It's way too soon to see if it made a big difference but I thought eh, I'll take a look. So I pulled the drawer out and what surprised me was you know here's the screen and half of it's got covered in algae and half of it's bone white. I was like what the heck happened? That's so weird. I couldn't understand how half the screen could be white, like it had no algae on it at all. And it, I discovered that the spray bar on the top was only spraying the back half of the sheet and that the front half, no water was coming out. I don't know why. I don't know what changed or what caused it because I did notice when I was in there cleaning that it had algae growing on the spray bar. So I cleaned that off, but then it was flowing. So I thought it was set up correctly. So I slid the drawer in, but somehow half the sheet got no liquid on it. So the algae that I was growing and doing such a good job with not only uh, got no water, but it got cooked by the light and it dried and it flaked off and it died. And so I have like half a sheet with nothing on it and half a sheet that's growing algae. So, you know, I opened the valve more, created water to shoot out the jets and, you know, the whole thing is draining properly like it should, put the drawer back in. And so it, I'm, I kind of took a step backwards on my progress, which is kind of a bummer. So I just want to bring that up in case you run into anything similar with your own 
uh, turf scrubber, make sure your spray bar is equally spraying equally over everything. Make sure all the holes are unplugged in case uh, some are getting clogged for some reason. Uh, to, you don't have to go through the same thing I just did. But it does appear to me that my black shield in the bottom is making a difference because the bottom of the box was a lot cleaner. So I'm thinking after a couple of weeks, it'll be just completely clean down there. It'll just be water and no algae. Uh, Russell says, what other U YouTube reef channels do you watch? Oh man, if you hadn't said reef channels, I would have had an answer for you. <laughs> but reef channels, it's kind of varies. Um, occasionally I'll watch something from Tidal Gardens. And I like to watch uh, some things that Devin puts out on Reef Dudes. Um, I've watched a couple of, uh, there's a lot of stuff I see from Inappropriate Reefer on Instagram, so I don't watch, the in I don't watch his YouTube as much. Um, I've watched a couple of episodes, well, I'd say a couple, I don't know, a dozen of, uh, and it, well, he's not a reefer though, but he has a saltwater tank sometimes, and that's Joey King of DIY. Um, I watched some of the Coral View videos because they're always educational. I watched quite a few Marine Depot videos. Again, they were explaining a product. Um, I've watched a few of the BRS videos that, like BRS Investigates, those are interesting to me. Or like they did one uh, a few months ago that was like the top 20 people, the 20 mistakes refugium owners make. And I really wanted to hear what they had to say about that one, so I watched that. So, I mean, there's some of those, but there's none that are like must-see TV for me where I watch every week. And uh, like I said, I watch TV rather than YouTube. And so I'm, I'm not, you know, just jumping show to show. Now, other stuff I watch on YouTube, I watch I Justine, I watch Marcus Browley, and I watch Philip DeFranco because those three are either talking about tech or they're talking about stuff in the news. And I, I really like uh, Philip DeFranco's uh, format because he's just telling everything he can research. And it's not, I mean, he has opinions, obviously, and he's very clear about them. But it seems like he's telling the story down the middle. It doesn't feel like he's leaning one way or the other. And so I've really en enjoyed that. And not every topic he picks is a good one. And sometimes I'm just like, oh. but I've been watching him for a long time and I don't plan to stop. Why? Do you have some channels you recommend? Raheem says, how do you, okay, so Raheem, before you said, what are the best corals and fish, and now you already have a bubble tip anemone. What have you been doing over there? It's only been 20 minutes since we talked last. And by the way, all caps means you're screaming at me. I don't know that you know that, but you shouldn't do that. Um, if you want to write me, just write, add Mila's Reef, and then put your question, and I'll answer it. How do you stop a bubble tip from killing themselves from getting stuck in a wave maker? You're going to need to put a screen on the wave maker, on the pump, to protect the anemone from getting sucked in. You cannot make the anemone stay. You cannot make it do anything. A friend of mine years ago says it's a brainless bag of water that does whatever it wants. So you have to create a barrier between your power head and the anemone. Uh-oh. No sound? Let's see. Test, test, test. I see sound. This was a while back, so I'm assuming the sound is back by now, right? Yeah, okay, good. Thanks, guys. Sorry, I'm always 20 minutes behind what's happening on the chat. <laughs> Brad says, try dosing some audio. Skinner says, how often should you rinse the biomedia? And don't laugh at the canister. It works. Um, you're talking about like bio pellets? I never rinsed any. I mean, you would soak them before you put them in the reactor. I guess if you're trying to save some, you could rinse them off when you're refilling the reactor, like I do with calcium reactor media. If there's some media left, I'll rinse it off and I put it back in the reactor and I add more on top. But uh, I only do it when I'm cleaning the reactor. Did that answer your question? Uh, Jamie says, I asked you weeks ago about all for reef and you didn't know anything about it. I still don't. <laughs> 
And he said, I did some research. It turns out you can somehow dose all three majors without precipitation. Thought I'd let you know. All right, well, I need to know more about this. Uh, Dean says, can you tell us what you know about ORP using a new probe and how to get it high and adding ozone? Have you ever used it? All right, so an ORP probe just measures the oxygen reduction potential of your tank. And it's basically just a number. It's sort of like a oxygen thermometer. Most of us don't even care about what the ORP is, but it's some number, usually around 325 or higher, and it kind of floats around. When it suddenly plummets to like 180 or 200, that's when we step in and have to fix something and something's really wrong with the tank. People that are running ozone run, uh, they stay on top of their ORP probe because they don't want the ORP to get too high in the water. So they may set it up to where the ozonizer comes on at 375 and turns off at 425 and keeps it in that, you know, that range right there. Um, I've never run ozone. I've never seen the need. My tanks look crystal clear to me, so I'm just happy with, I mean, what, you know, you can see my tank right there, and that's at night with some blue light. But, I mean, for the most part, my clarity is really good, so I haven't seen the need for ozone whatsoever. And so my ORP Pro is more like a, an alert. If the number suddenly drops, I'll get a notification. Uh, Luis, uh, I probably answered your question already, <laughs> but uh, I was saying you're going to have to build a jig that is the shape of a curve, like for the curve of your protein skimmer, and you're going to mount it to your sumps in a rim, clamp it or double stick tape it, and then use the router to trim out the right amount, but it's not a decorative top. That top actually is functional. It's important. It's helping keep it from bowing out. Um, Tim, thank you very much for the super chat, and thank you, I appreciate that. Hey, Robert, how are you? Uh, ben says, I have little bits of bryopsis algae. How do I eliminate it before it becomes a problem? If you can remove the item that the bryopsis is on and use some peroxide, you can drip it from a syringe right on the weed itself and just get it wet, wait 30 seconds, maybe hit it again with a few more drops of peroxide, Wait another 30 seconds. Now take the rock, take a bucket of tank water, dip the rock in there to rinse it off, and then put it back in your tank. You'll find that that bryopsis will turn white over the next three days, and it'll just f flake off and blow away, and it'll be gone. That's the one method. If you cannot remove the rock because you bolted all your rocks together in your aquascape, maybe during a water change, you have the water down. You could then apply the peroxide specifically on that area. Try not to get on anything else. Uh, that'll be tricky. You definitely won't be able to rinse other than squirt it with some water, but you're actually putting peroxide right into your reef, even when you do finish the water change. So that's something to keep in mind. <laughs> Gary says, change the reruns. We already saw you cleaning the tank. Um, the videos were for May, so June will get new videos. I'm just running them because that was a lot of time to build those videos. And yes, I clean the tank every week. So it's actually true. Uh, Dicanthus Reef says, question regarding your 280 gallon reef, the terrace tabling Acropora colony, was it Acropora plana or Crayola? It was the Crayola. And uh, what happened was, Trying to think how it happened. It was really cool the way it tabled. I think I helped it somewhat. Like a piece came off and I set it on top. And then a little frag came off and I set that on top. And I basically, it became stair stepping down. And I remember one time this guy came over to my house. He just happened to be here to pick up something. And I was working in the tank and I think a piece broke off. And I said, do you have this acro? And he's like, no. And I was like, would you like it? And he's like, yeah. So I put it in a bag of water and I gave it to him. Of course he killed it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I reached out to him like a month later or two months later. He goes, oh, yeah, I died. And I was just like, man. But I had posted a picture of this coral that was probably the size of my hand. And people were like, oh, my God, I want to be your friend. What the heck? Why would you just give that away? I was like, well, it was in my way. And he was here. And they're like, oh, I need to stop by Mark's house. Uh, ben says, wouldn't it be easier to magnet clean the glass without sand? Magnet cleaning makes me nervous. 
Well, the cleaning magnets I use are not a factor with the sand. Matter of fact, sometimes I actually push it down into the sand and really get that area at the very bottom. Uh, because I'm using a larger grade of sand, the stuff's like three millimeters, if you need a number size, according to the package. And uh, I don't have it scratching the glass. Now, I do clean my cleaning magnet to make sure it's clean, but what you were seeing in this video was me using a razor blade. So I wasn't actually uh, polishing the glass, I was chiseling off every inch of glass to get it down to brand new glass for a new month. Uh, Legion Maps asks a great question. He says, I saw an older video of yours called Tammy's Reef and I'm looking into getting an 800 gallon tank, but how can I eliminate the loud sounds of those pumps like she had in your video? Her pumps were not loud. I kept telling that to everyone after the fact, but no one understands. Back then, when I filmed her tank, all I had was an iPhone, and I didn't even have an external microphone. We just used the microphone in the room, and when you walked around the tank, the iPhone amplified it like a hundredfold and made it sound really, really bad. And if and you know, they kept saying, "Mark, you know, everyone's complaining. My tank is so loud. It's not. It's not." I was like, "I know. I was there. It wasn't." And I kept putting in the comments, "It's not loud. It's not loud. It's not loud." And Eric went out and bought a decibel meter and went up to the tank and measured it, and it was nothing. And I pinned his comment at the top of that video where people could read it, but I guess no one read it. But the point is, they had a bunch of pumps under there. You really didn't hear them. It was just the way the iPhone picked it up. And it was super annoying that that happened, and I hated that it was a situation. And back then, I wasn't editing videos the way I do now, where I can actually go in and correct things or do noise canceling or whatever to actually make it true to life. But in real life, you can definitely run a huge tank with nice, quiet pumps. My reef is 400 gallons, so it's half of an 800 and it's essentially silent. I mean, it is so freaking quiet. I've got the most quiet gear on there. There's almost no sound. The sound at this point is the turf scrubber. <laughs> you know, I've even the dosing pump I had on the calcium reactor, I swapped it out with a Versa and it's dead silent. My protein skimmer is dead silent. My return pump's dead silent. My Vortex are the quiet drives. They're dead silent. I, you know, now I'm hearing like the low hum of a fan coming on, for example, to cool the water if it gets above 79.5. But my system is so quiet that I actually hear if anything turns on, even like a dosing pump coming on to trickle a little bit of uh, magnesium into the system. But no, you don't have to fear you're going to have loud pumps, especially if you're buying pumps that are quiet. Uh, she used a whole bunch of Vortec pumps, uh, Vectra pumps, those are very quiet. Uh, the Abyss pump is dead silent. Um, the gyres are inside the tank, so they're quiet. The Wave pumps, they come with Apex, those are supposedly quiet if you get the core just right. And the Vortex are quiet, so you have nothing to worry about just a stupid microphone that's all it was it misled the entire world um smoke and reefer says did you shape your sand like that or is it your power heads do you ever hover, uh, vacuum your sand bed does it spike the nitrates <laughs> i would like to shape my sand and leave it um <clears throat> so my sand is whatever it does the i would love to vacuum the sand because the tank is six and a half years old i'd like to just go in there and just really do a, a house cleaning a spring cleaning but I'm going to have to move so many corals off the substrate to do that. I don't want to. I just It sounds like work. And then I have to be very, very careful while I'm vacuuming that I don't break the big corals at the top that you're seeing right here. Because, you know, the tube's going to be very tall with a flexible hose and I'm working and I could bump and snap things off and I really don't want to do that. So it's like I want to do it, but I haven't done it. My sand bed, I set it up and I just don't touch it again and I leave it alone and I let the cleanup crew handle it. I like Nasaria snails and cucumbers. Uh, my red starfish is in there, fighting conks or sand conks. They're all sand cleaners, and they just do their job. When you're siphoning up the sand bed, there is a chance a nitrate test kit would show a higher number after cleaning because you kicked up a lot of detritus, and you see the water turn cloudy, so it makes sense you'd see a number. But it, there's nothing wrong with cleaning from time to time, you know, once in a while deep cleaning. But I'm not one of those guys that vacuums all the time, like the fish store does. Frank's vacuums his sand bed two, three times a week, and his sand always looks white. But if he stops vacuuming, they look dirty. It's one of those things, like, if you're going to be a vacuum guy, you have to always do it all the time. And if you are not going to do it, then you'll have a nice clean... I mean, my sand bed looks really nice, and I don't touch them at all. And, uh, yes, my power heads do have some effect, especially, like, right now, the uh, Vortec in the front of my tank all of my Vortex can be clean, but uh, what the Vortex in the front has a bunch of bubble algae inside of it. And so even though the propeller's spinning, it's causing this weird deflection and sending the water down, which made a hole in the sand bed. So, I mean, I looked at the sand, I was like, why is it doing that? And I looked at the Vortex, oh, well, no wonder. So I'm gonna clean the Vortex, and then I'll kind of rake the sand over a little bit and lift up that 1A can and get it back where it belongs.
Uh, Lee R Ryan says, hi from the UK, now using phosphate RX. Can you talk about growth and phosphate inhibiting it? What level will rising and falling slow with RX, et cetera, LPS and SPS grow same pace, which is odd, thanks. Wow. All right, so you're asking. Okay, I think I get where you're going. Phosphate or Rex will lower the phosphate quickly in your aquarium. I choose to use it on a uh, occasional basis, probably about five, six times a year. So every 10 to 12 weeks. No, every eight to 10 weeks. And uh, I use it to bring my numbers down from a high number, which could be very high. It could be 0 0.75, it could be 0 0.5, and I bring it down to like 0 0.1 again. And last week when I measured it was 0 0.1, which is great. And uh, I'm happy with that number and I'd like it to stay somewhere around there. Now, you're looking at my corals here. They may not be perfect, but they look really pretty. And there's a chance when the phosphate gets too high that number one, corals may stop growing. You talked about inhibiting growth. Uh, it could be nuisance algae tries to grow. That sometimes happens as well. So by bringing the phosphates down and keeping them somewhere at a lower point is ideal. But um, my reef is used to my roller coaster approach where I just let it build up slowly over time and eventually it gets to the point where I don't like it and I just knock it back down to where I need it to be and then it starts working its way up gradually over time and my coral's been through it forever and I've got corals that are 10, 12 years old that have been in it. So I have an entire video dedicated only to phosphate rex that you could watch maybe once, or twice, or three times. It talks about a lot of stuff. But that's kind of my viewpoint on it. I've, I never fear phosphate, and it's like it is what it is. And you know, if it gets too high, I just treat the tank to knock it down. I have no problem with counting out a few drops and being done and not thinking about it again. It's great, and I always dose it late at night when the lights are out. <clears throat> uh, e. Schlichty says, "How do you assess how many flow pumps you need in your tank?" Well, it's kind of a thing about flow when you're trying to, you know instill different power heads and put in uh, return nozzles to point different directions. You're looking at how the corals are responding to the movement of the water. You may even look and see how your food blows around in the tank when you put it in. Like flake food or frozen food, it blows around, you know, mini mices are going everywhere. You can kind of see if there's a dead spot. You know, is there any spot where you drop the food and it just rains down <laughs> and does nothing? Or does it just immediately blow and, and suck into a pump and move across? You know, that's the, we want chaotic movement in the tank. We want it everywhere. In my picture right here, the return pump is off. That's why we're able to see the corals, but the vortex are on, so the surface is still rippling. And then, of course, if Spock gets near the surface and does a lap, she'll create an extra ripple as well, because she's a little whale in that tank. But we want good, chaotic, mixed flow in the tank whenever you can. Some people choose to use a gyre method where it just moves the water in a big, giant laminar circle, and it's just doing this revolution around the tank. Um, I, I like chaotic. I like chaos. I like it where there's flow come this way and another one comes and they impact together and create some change. I like the random flow generators I use in my return nozzles that don't just spray out a certain stream, but they actually change and van randomly go to different points. It's uh, really interesting how they do that. You can put your hand in front and feel the water hit different parts of your palm. You're like, wow, there's no moving parts and it does that. But if you have areas of your tank that typically grow algae. If you have areas of your tank that typically grow cyano, it could be there's a lack of flow and you need more, you need another power head to fill the void, to fill the one area that's lacking. Oh, Scott, thanks. Uh, I've watched Aaron's Aquarium in the past and I was watching some of his videos and I've been following him on Facebook because he opened that store. He opened the store right before COVID-19 closed his store. Worst timing ever for a virus to hit. <clears throat> but no, I enjoyed some of his streams. Thank you, or his uh, videos. I remember when he uh, did a post on Facebook and he said, grab a curry and join me at eight o'clock. And I was like, what the heck's a curry? <laughs> so he had explained to me it was some kind of food. So apparently uh, people eat curry when they watch his show. Robert says, 
I started Microbacter 7 to help my Nopox regimen. I also have Razor and XM. Should I just do one bacteria at a time or could I combine them? Man, I have no idea. You guys are getting really good at asking me questions I know nothing about. Um, I don't know if you want to keep combining different bacteria. I kind of have a, an approach with things like I was talking with Tulio a few days ago, the guy that runs Reef Bright. And uh, we were talking about Live Rock Enhance, which I've been putting in my tank recently. And uh, I told him how when I'm doing anything in my tank, I try to do that one thing. I don't want to do five or seven different things because then I cannot tell what was solving it or what's causing a problem. But if I add one thing to the equation, I can observe the tank and see if it's going good or bad. And I can decide if I want to back off or if I want to continue. And so in that regard, I'm kind of saying in this situation where you're saying, can I combine these? I don't know if you should. I don't know if there's a need. I think that maybe use one, do what it needs to do, and then go to the next one if you want. But maybe talk to them directly because it's, you know, it's a Brightwell product and see what they suggest. Um, now, Nopox is Red Sea, Microbacter 7 is Brightwell. Anyway, I would talk with those companies and just see what they recommend or what they discourage. They might say, hey, I do, you know, they might say for a fact, no pox hates such and such. Never combine the two, and then you know. So that could be a thing. Let's see. Oh, um, Scott says uh, he was referring to Aaron's Aquarium about live coral sales. I never, well, I watched one episode of that with uh, Tidal Gardens, and it's fun to watch. I have no desire to sit through that ever again. <laughs> But Fan has such beautiful photography of the corals that you have something really nice to look at. But I don't buy corals that way, and uh, I'm, I am definitely not been sucked into the live coral sales that like Reef to Reef was doing for the last few years and uh, that others are doing. I like to watch uh, videos that talk about a topic that I want to know more about. Um, Robert says, I'm upgrading my lights from the Kessel A160 to the... Radeon Gen 5 XR15 Pro is awesome for my 60 gallon. And you're putting two on a 60? Wow, all right. Um, I guess that would work. Depends if, you know, like my Anemone Cube, it's a 60, right? But it's a two foot by two foot. But then my frag system is four feet long and it's 60. So maybe you've got a long skinny tank. Um, I would recommend you don't cook your tank with a lot of light. The new lights will be way stronger than the A160s, way newer technology. And then he asked, have you got yours yet? Mine is on the way finally. I got my email a couple days ago from Ecotech. I'd placed an order for a bunch of stuff, and they're including my lights, so I get to finally plug one in. I want to talk about the, the Radions for a second here because there's been some negative publicity about them recently, and it all happened right during COVID-19, of course, You know when, the sh when they're closed and can't really do anything. But the, uh, there was a lot of people posting where they got a light fixture and the frame that goes around the edge, you know, the bottom edge, the perimeter was cracking. Others were complaining that the cooling fan would only run at 100% or not at all. Like if it came on, it's just on, and then it would turn off. And uh, there was a third thing. Oh yeah, some, for some people the lights would come on in the middle of the night for no reason whatsoever. So apparently, from what I was told when I spoke with my, rep, my sales rep, all those things have been corrected. So if you've been on the fence and you're worried or, or you're, you've encountered a problem, they have addressed it. So the first thing is the frame cracking. If you have one that the edge is cracked on that you bought, they will sell you a part that you can just put on yourself and replace it. In theory, they could fix it for you, which is fine under warranty, but apparently it's such a long wait because no one's working <laughs> that it's just better for you to fix it yourself. But uh, it was a problem apparently in shipping. I kept thinking it was a problem in assembly, like some employee just tightened the screws down way too tight, you know, too much torque, but uh, apparently it was a shipping thing. And uh, they just got broke. So anyway, they send out the replacement part. You can fix that. The cooling fans was exactly what I was hoping it was going to be. It's a firmware update. And the firmware update went out a few days ago. So if you haven't updated your Radeon, you definitely want to do that. And that will not only correct the problem with the fans, but it's going to correct the weirdness where the lights come on in the middle of the night for no reason whatsoever. So there's just, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to spook you, Robert, about your brand new light that you got. I mean, I'm getting one too. But there is something to be aware of. And... You know, we want to make sure that we're on top of it. And it's kind of a bummer that something bad happened right when um, when the virus came, you know, because otherwise they'd normally just be there and they'd be handling it and, the, you know, customer service would be on top of it and you'd just be taken care of. Uh, Marcus says, my ORP is 440 and I don't run ozone. 
there's a good chance your probe needs to be cleaned. Uh, you want to make sure it's nice and clean. You want to also make sure it's not super old. They don't last forever. But that's a very high number. It's kind of unlikely. Uh, John says, thanks for the skimmer stand. It works perfectly. Yay. Also built a saltwater mixing station. This is something I've wished I had the last time I set up my reef. Yeah, having a nice organized system for anything you're doing is going to make your life easier. Uh, Ishlikti says, did you end up figuring out how to mount the hose for your mixing station? Yeah, I made a wooden bracket and I bolted it into the stud of the wall and it fully supports it. And now I can do what I got to do and not feel like I'm going to rip off the plumbing off my system. Bandit says, would it be possible for a three inch bubble tip anemone to eat a 1.5 inch clownfish? Bubble tip anemones don't eat clownfish typically, but there are some times where a clownfish will literally swim into the mouth and swim back out. I've seen that, it's insane. I've seen them also, do, you know, certain clowns do that in carpet anemones. Like the Clarkie can literally go and make the belly of the anemone its home. <laughs> and it's just crazy. You see a little face poke out. And you know, you you spook the fish and it goes dives into the mouth and comes back out. It's crazy, crazy. But it's not normal for a clownfish to die in an anemone. So I don't think that would be possible. Uh, Lawrence says, what is your ammonia level? I don't know. I haven't tested ammonia in forever, but odds are it's gonna be 0.25 or less because there's always some ammonia because everything in the tank is peeing. That's part of the cycle. Um, there's always a little bit of ammonia that's being converted to nitride nitrate, and it gets converted very quickly. But, uh, yeah, it is what it is. All right, let's switch this. Take that one. Uh, Adam says, how many inches of sand do you have in your tank? It's about four inches, maybe five inches, depending on which part of the tank you measure. Uh, Glenn says, I'm thinking about culturing copepods to see how easy or hard it is. After all the effort, are they really a positive introduction to the aquarium, even if they're not being eaten by the fish and coral? <clears throat> yeah, no, you should. And there's a guy inside Club Miller's Reef that is breeding tons of pods and growing algae. And he's got, he showed a video the other day of the side of his house and it was just tank, 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 tank. And he's just growing all this stuff just so he can feed his tank, you know, live foods. It was really cool. So that'd be a great guy to talk to, to ask questions about. Uh, Lee says, do you adjust the flow rate in your reef at night or through the day? Thanks for the RX answer. I treat phosphate the same, probably the same, some effect on the frags until they adjust to the PO4 cycle. Yeah, you might see some change. I mean, think about it. You use phosphate RX in the tank. There's a flocculant. It hits every polyp. It hits every surface. And it could be the coral even has to slough off some of that off of its tissue temporarily. But the flow should blow it off too. And the other part, do I adjust flow rate? Well, <clears throat> not really. I've, I've set up some programming in my uh, EcoSmart Live menu where I told you know, the Vortex to do these five different um, flow patterns throughout the 24-hour day. And so it's in a different shift. It's like a constant flow at night. During the daytime, there's a reef crest version. There's a nutrient export mode for a little while that happens briefly. Um, it, it could, just because there was some other ones, so I just went with them. But I don't like tell my tank go to 40% at night and then go to 80% during the daytime. It's nothing like that. It's more like I just picked a pattern. And I just programmed it once and never looked back. Tank Tools asked approximate time frame for an 18 by 8 by 6 tall acrylic box with no lid. Probably three weeks, I guess. Raheem asked, what's the best LED lights for growth of the corals and which lights do you use? I really like the Radions, um, so that's the one I'd recommend. Uh, it's one I'm familiar with and it's easy to set up. But there's a lot of different choices, including the uh, Kessel 360X, which is nice. You could use that if you wanted. Uh, what brand is Minion? Um, why would you ask me that? You know, actually, I never remember that. I always run out there and take a picture of the gantry when people ask me what is it, so I can show them what it is. I don't know. Um, but the company that built it is here in Dallas, which is nice. So in theory, if I ever get myself in a pickle and it's broken, 
I should be able to get a hold of them and pick up the part I need and get the machine running again. So far, no, nothing bad has happened. Uh, Ishlikti says, how often do you clean your Apex probes? Uh, probably every four to six months I'll get in there because I'll be cleaning the sump and I'm like, let me get the probes while I'm at it. <gasps> I'm near the bottom of the chat. Oh my God, this is good news. Um, Jay says, that's a bummer how the frames keep cracking. Well, it's not that they keep. I feel like, I mean, I don't know. This is all conjecture on my part. But I'm guessing that the plastic trim piece either wasn't made thick enough or didn't have like the reinforcement rib, you know, that's on the backside of some plastic things. You, you open up and look and you see like a little cross section or there's a support rod or something. And I just assume that part wasn't made strong enough. Or like I thought originally, there was an employee that was screwing these things down. Like his job was put in eight screws, put in eight screws, put in eight screws. And he, that's all he does. And he's like... Burr, 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 burr. And I just assumed he just cranked the heck out of them and just cracked a million of these things and just probably fired. That was my assumption, but maybe that's not the case at all, and maybe it really was just that the way they're boxed, they just didn't do well in shipping and they got broke, you know? So I don't know, but it's not like they keep cracking, like as in they'll send you a new one, that one's going to crack, and they send you a new one, that one. <laughs> I don't think that's the scenario. I think they send you the new one and you're good to go, whatever was wrong with it. Uh, Carlos says, what type of sand do you recommend for a reef aquarium? I'm thinking of either Carib Sea Fiji Pink or Carib Sea Reef Ready. Well, I like Tropic Eden, and I like the one that's called Reef Flakes, like flake food. And that one is my favorite. That's the one I've been using for the last 10 years. And it works really well. It doesn't blow around in the tank much. Um, it looks nice and clean. It's a little bit bigger, so it can handle more flow in the tank. But Carib Sea Fiji Pink is another nice one. And they also, Carib sea also has live sand you can put in your tank as well to seed that sand and get some life and bacteria in there that you need. True Reef says, do you plan on redoing the tank? I hope not. I mean, obviously I'll have to get Dwayne out here again to help me frag some corals because I don't want to do it. But, uh, you know, for now it's doing great. I mean, when I got this tank set up, I, when I bought this tank in 2009, I was doing my dream tank and it was my 10-year tank. And I got it in 2011, installed it, filled it up with livestock, and 13 months later it sprung a leak, and I had to send it back for repairs. And uh, seven months later I got it back, sent to me, built backwards. <clears throat> so I had to get rid of it, and they had to build me another one, which took another um, 11 months to arrive. So this tank right now is version 2, and it is more than six and a half years old. So I guess I have three and a half years of life on this tank in my brain. You know, mentally speaking, it's a 10 year tank. And you know, if it goes longer, that's great. But I don't really have a desire to change the aquascape. I don't really have a desire to even touch the corals, but I have to because they get too close to the glass. So I will have to go in there and do some cleaning at some point. And I hate that part. I just can't stand it. I feel bad because I know what it's going to look like. And I'm going to hate my tank for months on end until it finally gets its stride and starts looking good again. So that one's, you know, it's tough for me to go in there and cut all these beautiful corals that are on the background right now behind me. Let's see. Robert says, any thoughts on the Garf Bonsai, or I'm sorry, the Garf Bulletproof DSP? It has a deep sand bed raised on a screen like a plenum. Um, Sally Joe Headley says it's still the best. I don't have an opinion. Um, I Plenums was back in the day, and Plenums required you to suck out some of the solution from down underneath every so often for the benefit of the tank. And myself, I just have sand down to the bottom of the glass. So uh, I've never done it. Uh, Note Lore says, my 30 gallon tank is nine months old and there's a white clear film growing on all of my rocks. Any idea what this is? It could be some kind of carbon dosing. You're putting in something in the tank or you, like for example, let's say you're carbon dosing with vinegar, like white vinegar. Um, that one can create this weird film. It's like a bacterial film that starts growing on the rock. And I've seen some people where it just takes over like spider webs. It's horrible. So 
if you're putting in anything other than salt water in your tank for now, maybe back off of that for a time being and let whatever's happening in your tank dissipate. It'll take some time to die off. It'll, what happens is it'll reach a peak and it'll collapse because there's no more fuel for it to continue to live. But, uh, you know, no pox creates a film that can be annoying. Carbon dosing can cause it. If you soaked your rocks in vinegar and then took the rocks out and you rinsed off and put them in your tank and they suddenly start doing this weird whitish film or gel, that, again, it's, I'm thinking in my head vinegar, but it could be, you could be dosing just about anything that could cause it. So whatever it is you're dosing, stop. Focus on the regular water changes, focus on feeding, focus on alkaline calcium magnesium. That's it. And uh, don't add other things that are causing chaos. Even when I overdosed my tank with Prodibio at one point, and it, it caused all the green in my tank to go away. It was the weirdest thing ever. Everything that was green turned brown. <laughs> there was zero green in the tank. But the blue and the orange and all that, they were totally normal. It just affected green pigment for some reason. I just stopped dosing Prodibio for three months or 12 weeks. I just told myself, well, my tank's going to take three weeks, or it's going to take 12 weeks to recover from what I just did. And it did. And after three months, it was back to normal, and then I just resumed what I was dosing. So that's what I would recommend with your small tank. Um, Smoking Reef says, how long and thick is your lipstick ting? <laughs> You're talking about Spock. Um, I don't remember by heart. I think it was nine and a half inches. And I know she measured the thickness, but I can't remember now what it was. Um, I'll try to find out. And next time, ask me again on the next stream, and I'll tell you. Raheem, when you type in all caps, I'm not going to answer you. Uh, Glenn Smith, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate that. Thanks, guys. You know... I appreciate your support. You know, it's it's a hard thing to go through, and uh, I'm not happy about it. And I've been lucky to have my mom as long as I've had. So, um, thanks. Uh, Salty Humor says, "Did you plumb your return into the display with two outputs off of one pipe, <clears throat> rather than splitting into two pipes for a reason other than aesthetics?" Um, I did it off of one pipe for uh, cleanliness, ma mainly. I have one pipe that's coming up behind the tank, and it just elbows over the top and goes straight across, and the flow dips in. And theoretically, one will probably push out water harder than the other because it's the first point of exit. You know, or, you know, the water can egress more rapidly than the one that's go through more pipe and then egress. But for the most part, because I'm using flow accelerators that create back pressure, they feel pretty equal, but I didn't really want to run two pipes up. You know, even if you went with uh, initially my first, and the the plumbing is still on Reef Addicts. Uh, when I first built it, I had the pipe go up, go across, go down into a T, and then it went out equally into the tank, and that was fine. But it was huge. <laughs> so when I redid it because I had a new tank, you know, to replace the one that leaked, I went ahead and just went with a straight elbow and just went down and in. And it's worked out perfectly fine, and it's cleaner. It just it, I think that's my primary reason. And I have a huge union on the top, whatever that is, inch and a half, and I can unscrew it and remove the entire assembly and go really clean it, which I've only done once. But I have the ability to actually remove the entire assembly, stick it in an acid bath, really clean it up, and reinstall it. Or if there was a big change I had to make, I can disconnect the union and restart with a new section up there. That was pretty much it. Uh, McGraw said, how did it go with Spock? Did the doctor fix her eye? No, um, the doctor just saw it and said, we'll come back. The eye looks worse to me now than it did before. But she, at the time, said there's no uh, indication that anything should be done. There, you know, She wasn't in pain. She wasn't scratching it. There was no bacterial infection because she studied it under a, a UV light. And uh, she said, it's just, there's like this cloud in there. And it, it looks more like a white ball to me right at this point. It's bad. And she even found some on the other eye. I was like, no. So at some point, Spock is going to be, you know, in a really bad spot. Uh, the vet had said she could actually remove the bad eye. And I'm like, no. <laughs> I don't want her to have one eye. That's terrible. But since she's not hurting and there's no distress, and she said, 
she called Spock a solid five, which was great. Um, I still smile when she said that because I'm like, what's a five? That doesn't sound very good. And she has a scale of one to, or zero to 10 and zero is emaciated and 10 is obese. And she says Spock is a solid five. And I thought, well, that's a heck of a compliment. So I'm doing a good job with her. It's just unfortunate she dinged her eye at one point. But uh, in the meantime, you know, she still chases food down and, you know, she's, she's constantly, I feel like she, the good thing is when she faces that direction, um, you know, away from me, her good eye, I think she watches TV with me. <laughs> I really do. I mean, I think she watches me, but I kind of look at her and I, I see her eye and I think she's watching TV with me. I think she's totally into the office. Uh, Smoking Reefer says, what are the dimensions of your tank without the sump? Uh, best natural reef tank I've seen. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Um, the tank is 84 inches long, 36 inches wide, and 30 inches tall. And then the plastic trim makes it even bigger. And then the external overflow box makes it longer. But the viewing area, what you're looking at in the video right now, that's 84 inches or 7 feet long. And so when I'm standing at the end of the tank looking full length, I'm actually looking at seven feet of reef in front of me. And so sometimes I share a picture on Instagram or I share a video here on the channel that shows the tank from that perspective. And it's really, really pretty. It's a great view. And I got inspired for that view from Steve Weist, who had a beautiful reef tank back in the day in uh, Oregon. No, in Washington State. And he, no, Oregon, because he his website was called OregonReef.com. And he uh, had a... I think the tank was four feet wide and it was 84 inches long. And you could only look at it from the four foot wide end. The big long ends, the 84 inches, was actually on the other side of the wall in the garage. And so you could only view the reef the full length all the time. And it was really cool. And I was like, you know, I want that view. <laughs> so when it was time to build my dream tank, I was like, all right, I want the 84 inches long. And the maximum I could get away with was three feet. And that's what's in this tank. Or that's what's in this room now. Uh, McGrath says, is it normal for alkaline to drop by 0.3 dKH each day when I don't have any corals, just fish? You know, um, alkaline is being used up by a lot of things besides the fish. You got fish, you've got coralline algae, um, you've got the, uh, the rock work itself, there's bacteria within, I mean, everything is using something up. So we dose alkaline and calcium, but normally we don't have to dose much in a fish-only system. But, you know, again, how old is your tank? You know, are you measuring your tank every single day and every single day you notice a 0.3 drop? Or because it does, it goes, it gets used up during the daytime and then it doesn't get used during the night. We've learned from all the research that's being, being done by Jim Welsh back when he was inventing the thing that we now call the Trident. He had this strong suspicion that alkalinity is only being taken up during the daylight hours and that at night the corals are at rest. They're not using any alkalinity for growth. And he made a device, and he basically proved it with graphs. It was really cool. But, uh, you know, there's always going to be an ebb and flow or a raise and lower of numbers in our tank. And it isn't always just because of corals. It could, you know, there could be other things in your tank, like snails. They're using the alkalinity to grow a shell. Um, fighting conchs, they grow shells. Clams, they use it up for their shells. So there's a lot of things that can use alkalinity. And so we dose to bring it up to the number we want. And the whole point of two-part dosing is to keep it as close to the same number all the time. Uh, Skinner says, I have white spaghetti sponge starting to grow on my rock work. It's five months old. Is this good or bad? I like sponge. I have no problem with it. But if sponge bothers you at some point, you can always remove what, what is offending you. But I have a whole bunch of white sponge growing in the anemone cube. It's on the other side of this scene you're looking at right now. And uh, a big piece blew off or tore off and it started spinning. And then one of the little green anemones grabbed onto it. And I saw the little bubble tip just tumbling around on this big white sponge tumbleweed. And I was like, man, you picked the wrong thing to grab onto. And then finally that ball of sponge wedged into a rock and the anemone walked off again and the sponge is still there. I never did get rid of it. Occasionally a small piece will break off and land in my power head and that I'll remove because it's ugly. Uh, 
uh, Michael Wells says, what is the branching purple SPS coral at the top and the middle? I really like it and it looks great. That is the Stylophora. It's called the Milka coral and it is a, a very hard coral to cut. It, the skeleton is super dense compared to like Montipora digitata, which you could just barely tip with your finger and just snaps right off. That stuff, you know, it takes a serious bone cutter. I like to use a saw to cut through it. The Milka coral is called Milka because it is the same color as the chocolate bar called Milka. <laughs> so someone nicknamed it that a long time ago, and I got it from Joe's 20,000 gallon reef, and it's become a ginormous piece, and it's actually shadowing a lot of stuff, and I need to cut it, and I don't want to. It's really, really pretty. I actually bought some new cutters that are ginormous. I feel like they're like bold cutters. I was like, I'm going to need it for that coral specifically. Uh, Glenn says, how is your Ecotech dosing pump, the Versa? Is it quiet and easy to use and worth the money? What's your opinion as I'm thinking about getting one at the end of the summer? Uh, so I love it. Uh, when I got mine, I didn't hook it up for a long time. And then finally I removed the Camor that I used for my calcium reactor and put on the Versa. And initially, because it needs to hang somewhere, I just set it on the edge of the sump. And it just does its thing. It's really easy to use an app to control it. And I just, I watched Reef Dude's video how to do it because I was easier than reading the manual. <laughs> and I followed his directions. And I did exactly what he said and I did it. And I was like, oh, okay, that was easy. And then I uh, got it running. And then after, I don't know, a week or so, it was like making this weird like noise. And I was like, why is it doing that? And it was kind of annoying. I was like, man, I wanted a quiet pump. I thought this thing was quiet. Anyway, you know, I looked at it. I looked at everything. I was like, there's nothing that explains why it's making this sound. And then one day I got motivated. I was in the garage making stuff and I made a cute little wooden stand that you might have saw on my Instagram. And I used the wooden stand to mount the Versa on so it could, you know, just be plunked on the edge of my sump with a dosing pump right here. And lo and behold, <laughs> as soon as it was mounted vertically the way it's supposed to be set up and not just laying on its back, it became dead silent. And I was like, I never would have expected that. That's fantastic. So the whole sound thing that was starting to bug me wasn't a thing at all. It was my own fault for being lazy. So I do recommend you hang it up on the on the cabinet or on something in the first place so it's nice and secure. And uh, I talked when I placed my order with Ecotech recently, I said, listen, I know you're not selling the Versas right now. I mean, right now they're only making Radions and uh, Vortex. Uh, but the tube that goes over the rollers, I need another one of those because if mine fails, I'm stuck. And so I made sure to order a few of those. And I got one for myself for the tank and I got a few for the shop in case any of you have a Versa and need that one part because that is the part that will wear out and needs to be replaced at some point. But very, very quiet once it was installed correctly. And uh, yes, super easy. I programmed it once and never touched it again. So at this point, like I was saying earlier in the stream, I want to take my calcium reactor apart. I want to measure the flow coming through the verse. I want to make sure it's correct or do I need to update something or recalibrate it for the right amount of flow for each rotation. So I want to kind of make sure it's all fine-tuned and correct. But uh, yeah, definitely a great pump and uh, I actually placed an order for 12 of those as well as two of the four packs. And when I talked to my sales guy, I said, look, I placed that order with you months ago. Is that still in queue? You know, is that still going to happen? Because I don't want to show you know when you finally start making these pumps i don't want to hear i'm at the end of the line again he says no no you place your order back then you are still there so when they start making them i'm going to get the order they'll go in the shop and they'll be available for you guys uh jeff k says do you know of any websites to show plumbing from the tank to the sump um there's some on mine so you can go to milosreef.com and you can go to articles, you can go to plumbing, and there's quite a few articles that show quite a bit of plumbing. Uh, Reefaddicts.com has quite a few articles by me about plumbing as well. And then, of course, there's going to be plenty of YouTube videos out there as well that you can check out. Uh, Salty Humor says you should put on Star Wars for TV for Spock. On TV for Spock. I've done that before. Trust me, I watched every single one of the Star Wars movies. She watched uh, Clone Wars with me from the beginning to the end. <laughs> she uh, definitely enjoys TV. Hey, Don just got the uh, power brick holder. He placed an order about a week ago, um, and I had already had one built ready to go. 
And so I sent that to him, and it just arrived. Yay! I'm glad you thought it was well built. They are. They're not flimsy. They, I build stuff that's supposed to last. So I'm really glad that uh, you got that. Um, I see people talking about ginger. Apparently it doesn't help. So uh, there was an idea a while back where someone said, hey, I'm thinking about using ginger to help fight ick. And a lot of the fish experts were like, that is the stupidest thing they ever heard. And they all made fun of him. And I kept thinking, why are you making fun of this guy? I mean, what if he's right? What if he figured something out? And so I kind of supported him. <laughs> I always support the underdog. And then it uh, turns out it doesn't do anything. Uh, Raheem, the anemone cube is 60 gallons and is a nice size tank. And I like the salinity to be around 1.026. And thank you for not using all caps. Russell says, do you think leaving the RODI system outside will have adverse effects, even if the temperature does not exceed 80 degrees or get direct light? Yeah, see, that's the, the thing. I, no, it'd probably be okay outside. If, you're, if you can really control the climate, that'd be great. But um, if it's going to get any sunlight on it ever, that's bad. If it gets really cold in the winter, if it gets really hot in the summer, that's a factor too. But like right now, maybe this time of year, your weather's cool enough to where you can get away with it and it's in a shady spot where it can't get any sunlight, it could be okay. Um, so yeah, there's your answer. Uh, Jamie says, I have the Kimura X1 pump. Do you know if you can replace the pipe on, or the, I think that he's talking about the tubing mount. I think that's a piece you have to get. I don't know for a fact. I'll try to find out. Um, I've been wondering for a while because, like you said, if something were to break, it's point, we want to fix it. Uh, Mike Flores says, what do you use to clean the Apex probes? Um, I actually like to use vinegar and water. And so I'll, I'll take a small cup, I put in a little vinegar, some water, and I put the probes in there and let them soak. And then I'll take a toothbrush with soft bristles. That's really important. There's different grades of toothbrush. There's medium, there's coarse. You want super soft and you know, or extra soft. And you just brush the, you can use a sponge to clean the tube and then a brush around the head. And there's all these little weird, oh, so there's a glass ball in one of the probes. There's a little wire that comes off the side. There's one with a little thing. And I remember it, in the past, I'd take like a toothpick and I'm really clean. I'm like, what the heck is this thing? And it snaps off I'm like, oh, that was important. So don't get overly aggressive. If you get a brand new probe, really look at the end of it while it's brand new to know what it looks like clean. That way, later on, when you're cleaning it, you, you can recognize the components and not damage some important part of what makes it work. But uh, a soft toothbrush and vinegar water works really great for me for cleaning them. And then after that, I can go ahead and calibrate and put it right back in the system. Gary, do you really think you're going to get a rise out of me? Just type in all caps. Come on. <laughs> all right, that's it, guys. Uh, we had a great live stream. Thank you so much. I have no idea if there's going to be a live stream next weekend. I have a feeling there will not be because I think I will be still with my mom. Um, so I want to thank you guys for tuning in. Today is Water Test Saturday. Please test your water. Clean out your waste collector. Install your waste collector. Buy a waste collector. Uh, make your life easier. Uh, make sure all your dosing is working correctly. Hit the test button on each one of the different dosers and make sure liquid's coming out of the tubings, you know, so everything's working the way it should. If anything's low, refill it. You know, we want our tanks to be healthy and happy. And, you know, right now we're almost at the point where people are going back to work and they're going to start abandoning their tanks again. So you've had a couple of months to really fine tune and make everything perfect. So now they should be able to run really smoothly if you've done your job. And if you haven't, you still have this weekend to get things knocked out and get things on track. If, um, you like we would love to see your test kit results post them in club meals reef there's about 150 people waiting to get into club meals reef right now i'm going to work on getting them added tonight finally um because i actually go through each application and you know there's three questions you need to answer if you didn't answer the questions i automatically delete that one because they didn't even have the time to do that so why would i think they'll follow the rules in the group 
But uh, other than that, you know, we'd love to have you in there to see your tank, see your, your favorite coral or fish, you know, answer your questions, help you ID things that you don't recognize. It's a great group, and we're coming up on close to 8,000 people. And, uh, you know, happy to have you there and interact with us throughout the week. Other than that, um, I'll give you guys an update when I know more. But uh, for now, I'm going to spend a little bit of quality time. Obviously, i got to work on some customer things right now before I leave town. And then um, I'll spend some quality time with Mom. And uh, then I'll be back, and uh, we'll continue from there. So, like I said, I'm pretty sure there won't be a stream next weekend. Bye, guys.